Today's episode sponsored by Civic Engagement Podcast, Future Hindsight. We're back with an all new season on systemic racism in the U.S. Each week, they'll explore how the legacy of colonialism still permeates our country and how we can rectify it. This week, they explore the role of unconscious bias in early childhood education, how it can set up kids for failure before school even starts. Listen to Future Hindsight wherever you get your podcasts. And now, for this show. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, senior national correspondent at HuffPost, author of The Ten-Year War, Obamacare, and The Unfinished Crusade for Universal Healthcare, Jonathan Cohn will join us. Meanwhile, as the third vaccine begins distribution, White House brokers a deal with Merck to up production. Senate Democrats in final negotiations on the COVID-19 relief bill, looking for reoccurring payments and automatic unemployment extension. Third woman now accuses Andrew Cuomo of unwanted creepy physical advances. Bernie Sanders plans a $15 minimum wage amendment. It's COBRA subsidies and union pension support survives the bird test. Jim Jordan and the Republicans want the House Judiciary Committee to hold a hearing and yes, cancel culture. The Biden administration starts a Taliban negotiations. Ted Cruz's approval ratings go south after his Cancun jaunt. New Mexico Attorney General sues Pharmaceutical maker Gilead over antitrust violations and production of HIV drugs. The Trump administration siphoned money to fund Operation Warp Speed, leaving hospitals desperately underfunded during COVID. And lastly, Health and uh, Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas says the entire immigration system is broken and that they will allow separated families to reunite in the U.S. All this and more on today's program. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, joining me as uh, always, Emma Vigeland. Hello, Emma. Hello, Sam. How are you doing today? Well, hanging in there. Uh, good news, I guess, on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the vaccination front there we're going to see more of those uh, johnson and johnson uh vaccinations uh that uh, and they're already being distributed as we speak uh unfortunately some of the states are starting to take the uh, good numbers uh a little too um uh, a little too much to heart and we're seeing a little bit of a plateau on the numbers across the country uh, this is uh, happening across the in, in many respects across the world i mean people are just getting sick of everybody hits the wall it feels like at the same time like every couple of months it feels like there's another wall that you hit yeah and i think the winter weather is compounding that it's making that that wall uh even even sturdier i guess just uh, i think everybody's so sick of being inside it's 
it's understandable, but I mean, it can be alleviated by strong leadership by governors and uh, lawmakers. I mean, it's it's sometimes it's when you you can sort of see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. It's not quite a light. It's more of like a just a glow a little bit. But sometimes that makes you uh, a little bit more impatient to get out there. And I feel like that's what's happening on a mass level. Uh, but uh, folks uh, still, you know, we're nearly there. And um, if uh, folks continue to follow best practices, uh, even after you get your, your vaccination to help everybody get across the line, uh, you know, we could have a, a decent summer and maybe, you know, some type of, um, broadly speaking, more or less return to normalcy um, by fall. But we, we will see. Uh, in the meantime, there have been ongoing hearings on the Hill um, regarding the January 6th uh, riot and attacks. Um, a lot of news in the wake of that. Uh, some of the far right groups are, are splintering, according to the New York Times, in wake of the Capitol riot. They all have a different idea of how they can be um, white nationalists or white supremacists or, um, you know, thugs or whatever. Like they, they, they all have different uh, perspectives on that and they all want to be heard. And so you're going to get a lot more uh, splintering of groups. Um, meanwhile, John Brennan, let's play this clip of John Brennan. It is fascinating how some people are uh, using, and, and well, look, we've seen this with the whole never Trumper phenomenon, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I don't know that John Brennan was, it could be considered a never Trumper. Or, I mean, I think he identifies, I don't know, as a Democrat or maybe an independent, um, but he was the former CIA director. And before he was the, uh, the CIA director, he was head of counterterrorism under Barack Obama. And before he was head of counterterrorism under Barack Obama, he was at the CIA during the torture regime of George uh, W. Bush. And well, let's just uh, listen to see. You would imagine someone who has been involved in uh, endorsing the torture regime in setting up the drone assassination program, which killed not only an American that was supposedly targeted, uh, but also his 16 year old son at a later date that was supposedly a mistake. His daughter has since been killed too, a young child, American, American born. Um, you would imagine this is a guy who would have a lot of things that he would be embarrassed about. But is it any of those things? No, it is not. That's why we started with Kate, Katie Benner's great new reporting about the investigation into police officer. It renders, you know, at best hypocritical, at worst cynical and false, any notion that the Republicans care about the lives and the safety of law enforcement. Well, I must say, to Claire's point, I'm increasingly embarrassed to be a white male these days. <laughs> and what a Light of what I see of my other white males saying, but it, it just shows that with the ex with very few exceptions like Mitt Romney, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, there are so few Republicans in Congress who value truth, honesty and integrity. And so they'll continue to gaslight the country the way that Donald Trump did. And the fact that this has such security and safety implications for the American public and for the members of Congress, again, as Claire said, it is just a disgusting display of craven politics that really should have no place in the United States in 2021. It is. And I just want to a, a couple of point a couple of things out. Um, when you talk about gaslighting, um, the Cheney family gaslighted this country in a myriad ways. But one of the big ones wa was the Iraq war. Um, and the, uh, the entire neoconservative movement. I mean, I, it's just to, I, I, I appreciate that Lynn Cheney voted for impeachment. That was the right thing to do. But, um, the idea that all of this stuff is forgiven because you're against Donald Trump or because you're breaking from a Republican party that is, um, that, that nurtured all of this, nurtured all of it. Let's remember. Mitt Romney flew to New York 
to kiss Donald Trump's ring during his uh, run for president in 2000. Or after uh, he'd already won. After he'd already won, he kissed his ring in order to get the secretary of state position, which Trump obviously did not Yes, but I'm talking about in a position where he, you know, where there was no, like, well, maybe if I get on the inside, I can do, I can lessen the damage. When he was running as a nominee, he went and gave his prestige to Donald Trump as some type of signifier uh, in terms of Donald Trump's status. And so you have a guy here, and when we talk about gaslighting the country, also remember that John Brennan oversaw the spying on Senate staffers who were digging around trying to find information about the torture regime. Yep. So much so that Dianne Feinstein, I remember the day Dianne Feinstein like had this sort of like impromptu, uh, I think it was a press conference where she said like, this is the most disturbing thing I've ever seen in the Senate. Well, because uh, then they're, they're being spied upon. They have very little regard for when our intelligence agencies were spying on American citizens with impunity and illegality. Uh, but then, of course, when the Senate and, and Congress is affected, yes, they're very concerned. Look at how John Brennan centers himself to here. This is a lot of what you see with white centrist liberals i mean i guess he's a conservative but people who want to appear like they're sensitive to race and want to appear like they're um you know uh, repentant for the sins of white people and the fact that we enslave black people in this country and they try to to uh, appear a certain way you're still centering yourself by making it about your basically white guilt. And that's really what he's doing there. It's signaling to the audience there, I'm a good guy because I recognize this, as opposed to looking at it from a systemic lens, which if he's not going to do because the CIA has been, as has been documented throughout history, instrumental in upholding white supremacy. But I guess it, it, he washes it all away by centering himself and saying, look how woke I am by making that throwaway comment, not looking at his own role in upholding white supremacy and systemic racism as a part of the institution he, he, he was instrumental in and did all of those horrible things, as you mentioned, Sam, for years and years and years. And I think the reason why this re resonates, you know, you can go back, uh, I don't know, I can't even remember how, how many days ago it was. Just a couple of days ago, we uh, interviewed uh, an author of the book of, uh, of Identity Capitalism. And we just saw that in action there, where they're going to, um, in some fashion or another, roll out um, this, and, and yes, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's many reasons uh, to feel embarrassed uh, that uh, you're a white male at various times. But um, if you have been involved in what he's been involved with, there's a lot of other things that uh, are just I don't even important. think it's embarrassing, Sam. I think if you, if you, if your ideology and if you're trying to work for things that are correct, and, and just, you don't need to kind of make that over the top gesture. I mean, that's just a way to essentially virtue signal. And again, make your own, you know, personal uh, belief that, oh, you're, you're repentant and, oh, look at me, look, I have these, these uh, woke views, making yourself the, the center of attention as opposed to actually looking at the structures, which would be constructive. He's not interested in that. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to the senior national correspondent of the HuffPost and the author of The 10-Year War, Obamacare, The Unfinished Crusade for Universal Healthcare, with Jonathan Cohn. Meantime, uh, Magic Spoon is the uh, cereal that has amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. Uh, Emma and I are already smiling. because I, I so just uh, uh, I just finished off part of the last I had of the gingerbread, which was a specialty uh, flavor, but that's not the point. Uh, with Magic Spoon, there's zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs in each serving, and only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, it's gluten-free, it's grain-free, soy-free, it's low-carb, and it's GMO-free. And Magic Spoon will be releasing two amazing flavors this month for a limited time only. I have already ordered these. This is not part of the copy, but apparently you can sign up to get the uh, VIP treatment where they text it to you. And I, th I think you were there when I was doing that. Cookies and cream and maple waffle. And um, that's for the kids. Now, I, 
I mean, I'm I'm still a cinnamon guy, although I'm yeah, I know, that. but that fruity, I, I I didn't I thought it might be too fruity for me, like, and it wasn't. It was just right. It was really really good. I think I have a new favorite. Now you can also build your own box with these flavors: cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, and cinnamon. And if you're listening from Canada, Magic Spoon now ships there too. Look, uh, it is um, it's become. <laughs> Uh, I, I have become a uh, the cereal eater again, but uh, my kids love the cereal and it makes me feel good that I'm giving them something that isn't full of sugar and that they like it. Um, for me, it is, uh, I have to say, cinnamon, peanut butter, cocoa. Those are my, uh, my, my, my faves in order. Um, you can go to magicspoon.com slash majority report, grab the new limited edition cookies and cream maple waffle custom bundle of cereal to try it today be sure to use our promo code majority report at checkout and you save five bucks off your order this offer is now good anywhere in the u.s or canada but only when you use our code at checkout magic spoon is so confident in their product it's backed with a hundred percent happiness guarantee so if you don't like it for any reason they refund your money no questions asked remember get your next delicious bowl of guilt free cereal at magicspoon.com/majority report use the code majority report to save $5 off thank you magic spoon for sponsoring this uh podcast and frankly my breakfast almost every single day um too often we got to choose between quality or a fair price well uh here's the good news when it comes to shaving with harry's you don't have to choose Harry's gives you award-winning blades at factory direct prices. And for a limited time, Harry's is offering their starter set plus a free body wash for just $3 at harrys.com slash I gotta say, my uh, significant other uses that body wash and he loves it so much. The uh, oh, the shishu go. flavor. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. Like ever, I'm just, I'm, I'm authentic. I love it. It smells uh, good. Maybe. Yeah, well, I mean, you should check out what he's doing though he's talking about it as a flavor did i say flavor <laughs> yeah you i got really mad i got magic spoon on the brain um <laughs> harry's uh, uh, uh i've been using harry's for years now and it's true during uh covid in particular i have my shaving is down to rarely but when i do harry's delivers me a close comfortable shave and they do so at an incredibly fair price only two dollars per refill Harry's believes in quality so much, they bought their own factory in Germany so they could uh, own every step of the manufacturing process. And of course, the savings get passed on to you. Their German factory is one of the few manufacturers in the world that have mastered the technology to create a Gothic arch. It's the gold standard for razor blade grinding. I don't know. The, the blades are, are great. The, the razors, the handles are you know, sort of classic looking. They're not all buffy like those weird ones that you get in the store. They don't come in the huge plastic containers. I don't have to go to the store to get them. They send them right to me. Super convenient. Uh, just uh, uh, just a good value. And if you, uh, if you don't like what they're, they're sending you, you have 100% money back guarantee on harrys.com. For a limited time, Harry's has an exclusive offer for our listeners on this show, new customers can get a Harry starter set and a free body wash for just $3 at harrys.com slash majority. That's over $16 value for just three bucks. You get a five blade razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel, a travel cover, travel size body wash. It's an incredibly great deal, but act fast while supplies last. Go to harrys.com slash majority to redeem your offer. And lastly, uh, folks, everybody's shopping online these days, obviously. Um, it's an easy thing to do. My kid is now, that's basically, you know, it's, she's a little bit anxious about getting COVID, doesn't want to go into stores at the moment. Good for her, but she does all her shopping online. Uh, for both of us, and I've told this story where I like taught her, like when she first bought something, like God, I always search for the coupon code because you save five bucks and just trying to give her some sense of like, you know, it's not play money, even though you get most of it from your dad. Um, but that all became super easy. Thanks to honey. You no longer have to manually search for coupon codes. That's a thing of the past. Honey is a free browser extension. It scours the internet for promo codes. It applies the best one automatically and applies it to your cart. It supports over 30,000 stores online, ranging from sites that have tech and gaming products to fashion brands, even food delivery. 
Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the honey button drops down. All you have to do is click apply coupons. Boom. You wait a few seconds, honey drops the price if they find a working coupon. It's found over 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. I texted Mila this morning to find out like what her last purchase was. And because she uses honey. And I said, uh, what was the last thing you bought? She's like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, just uh, tell me something. She goes, I, I don't remember. And so I have to go back to the last thing, which was, do you remember what was like a, some serum at some place, like a aura or something like that? Um, it was, it was you explained it to me last time. But yeah, she said yeah. 15 bucks, she saved five bucks off it. Yeah. And that's real money, folks. I, uh, I use honey too. I'm trying to find my last purchase, but if you don't already have honey, you could be straight up missing on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid supporting this podcast. Get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash majority. That's joinhoney.com slash majority. Okay. Want to uh, welcome to the program. We have them. Okay, great. Uh, senior national correspondent, the Huff Post, the author of his most recent, The Ten Year War, Obamacare, and the Unfinished Crusade for Universal Healthcare. Jonathan Cohn, welcome to the program if we have you. You do. Oh, here there I am. it is. Oh, wow. Uh, that timing worked perfectly, too. That was perfect. Miracle Jonathan, good Zoom. to see you. I'm here with Emma Vigland. Uh, How you thanks doing, for joining Jonathan. Thank so, you so much for having me. Congratulations on, on your latest book. Um, this. Um, so you're not quite at a trilogy yet, but uh, but but who but but hope springs eternal, I guess. Um, all right, let's start with this. Now, the, you, this is a uh, basically a I, I mean, a TikTok is is obviously doesn't do it justice, but but you walk through the process of how you, you're basically looking at how the sausage is made, and uh, when it when it comes to um, Obamacare, the ACA. Let's, before we get into that, I want you to set the, the, you know, just give us a little bit of background on what happened in 1993, because so much of what happened in 2008, 9, 10, uh, and 11, I guess, or 10, really, with uh, the ACA was influenced by what happened in 2000, I mean, excuse me, 1993. Yeah, I, I, can I say, I'm so glad you asked that because that's such an important part of the book. And there's a very, that, that's where the book really starts. And, and, and that was a very deliberate choice. Um, I mean, the story of the ACA, right, is this, this long running crusade to get to universal coverage, sort of being, you know, running up against the history of failure. And the 1993 failure uh, was cataclysmic politically and left this deep psychic scar on the Democratic Party. And, and just to, you, you remember this, but I, I don't know how many of your, your listeners do. I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm older than I used to be. Same, I guess we're all, same, <laughs> I guess same. we're all older. Um, people forget, you know, Bill Clinton gets elected. It's like this really exciting moment for Democrats. I mean, they've basically been locked out of the White House since the 60s, except for the fluke of the Jimmy Carter election. They've been on the defensive. And here's this young, you know, energetic president. He's like, he's like literally shook Kennedy's hand. He's the new generation and healthcare is going to be big, big thing. He gives this big speech in front of Congress. Hillary Clinton, who is like, you know, goes to testify, which has really never been done this way before. And she like wows all the committees because she's the one in charge of writing the bill. And it really looked like this thing was going to happen. And then it just fell apart. And, and every and, and possible. what was it though? I mean, tell people what it was because I don't think people remember. I mean, this was, you know, I, I mean, on some level, and, and I don't know, maybe there's a different book about this, about the, what that lesson taught the Clintons in that moment and how they shifted, um, you know, Bill Clinton shifted his presidency. But, but that was an aggressive bill. I mean, that was a good bill. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wrote at the time when they were debating the Affordable Care Act that, you know, we're going to miss the Clinton health care plan because that was a better on paper. That was a better health care plan. I mean, it was more comprehensive, more aggressive, really would have gotten, you know, close to univer truly universal coverage, um, really tried to get into the guts of a lot of what was wrong with the health care system. Um, but, you know, they ran into a bunch of problems. Uh, and, and afterwards, uh, you know, they, they, the, the people who worked on it really just obsessively sat down. And, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, obsessively, but they said like, what did we do wrong and how can we do better next time? And they kind of drew a set of lessons from that. And, um, you know, some of them were substantive. So like the most important lesson I think they took 
as a substantive lesson was the Clinton healthcare plan would have moved a lot of people who had employer coverage into something new. And the theory was it would be better. The Clinton healthcare was going to give you a better healthcare plan than when you got from your employer. I, I think it probably would have been. Um, I think, you know, they, 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 they really put a lot of thought into what these plans would look like. Problem was people got spooked. If you, you know, it doesn't matter that people thought their employer plans, they didn't like them or they were getting too expensive or they knew they could lose it with their job. You know, as soon as it became a real possibility to lose that plan and get something new that, that they freaked out. So the, 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 the conclusion was don't do that again. <laughs> Try not to disrupt if you can avoid it, and especially don't disrupt employer plans. And by the way, employers don't want to get rid of them either, and that's a whole other story. So, you know, don't do that. Relatedly, as a kind of more of a strategic approach, but also that would affect the policy, you're not going to win a war with the healthcare industry. You know, they got killed by the drug industry. They got killed by the insurance industry. And so the, the calculation was the only, and, and, and this, remember, it was not the first time. Harry Truman gets killed by the American Medical Association. And the, you know, the only way through is to sit down with these groups and say, look, this healthcare system is unstable. It's not ideal for you either. Let's figure out a way that you can give up a little. Maybe we'll pay you a little less here. We'll pay you differently there. And then we can use that savings to kind of some of that to sort of help people get insurance who don't have it now. So they were going to negotiate. It was not going to be an all-out war with the healthcare industry. And then there were a number of other lessons. But, you know, the two other big broad ones were stay away from big government. Um, you know, big government scares people. It may not scare people in practice, right? Everyone likes their Medicare, but they don't like the idea of big government. They don't like the idea of big taxes and regulation. And then uh, recognize the fact um, you're probably going to have to get at least some Republican buy-in at some point. So be on the lookout for a way to do that. And, and, and I, 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 I really truly think just as a lesson in terms of how the sausage gets made, this is like, the, I don't want to get into a meatpacking analogy here, but you know, the, the, the whole first third of the book, I, I spent a lot of time on all these sort of tasks. They were very unglamorous. You know, it was wonks going to conferences and it was these meetings in hotel rooms with interest groups. Like all this stuff meant that when the Democrats got to 2007, 2008, they were really, they were really ready to move. And, and they'd already worked out the big questions among themselves for better or worse right. on what a new system was going to look let me and before we get to to that um to 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 when we get up to that but in terms of the lessons that they learned and maybe this is sort of like you know outside of the portfolio because i mean if you're not you know i mean you had covered 2007 2008 i mean you were on this beat at that time and yeah. you were really on that beat i mean it wasn't it was, you you were even at that time and you and i are yeah similar age, I'd probably a little bit older myself, but, <laughs> um, but you weren't a Neo fight. And so, um, and, and, uh, but in 93, do you think that was the lesson? I mean, what the lessons that Democrats internalized, at least the, you know, the, the, the people who were sort of like going to be involved in that process, did they internalize, are, do you have the ability to assess whether they learned the right lessons? Because I mean, all I remember from that era and I was, I mean, I uh, was Hillary care was the, the way that they attacked us. It was Hillary care. And they would already had set up that Hillary Clinton was the first lady who was not going to stay in the kitchen. And there was, it was extremely gendered. Uh, I don't think there was, you know, and it was extremely um, like a, there was a lot of active pushback on the sort of, I mean, that's when Clint, uh, uh, Limbaugh was, you know, introduced feminazi. I mean, that that time was, it was very, very gendered, the whole thing. And I wonder if the lessons that they learned were somewhat trying to, you know, sort of like not acknowledging, like this was more of just sort of like a political messaging thing, or there was a lot of like Tinder there for these outside groups to sort of light on fire and it was going to catch quickly. Yeah. So I think they certainly learned that they should not expect a lot of cooperation and they should expect whatever they put out there was going to generate this very hostile pushback from a part of the Republican Party that was always there, but was getting more vocal, more extreme in its tactics, more extreme in its ideology. Um, you know, I really do think 
uh, the origins of so much of what we see, even, you know, not to zoom ahead in the story, but what we see today and what we saw with Trump, so much of it, it has its origins in the 90s. And that sort of that, that, that toxic mix of gender, it's gendered, it's got a racial layer to it, right? Yeah. Um, and this sort of uh, this desire to fight, 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 to, you know, declare Democrats enemy of the people. I mean, that all goes back to like Newt Gingrich, right? I mean, he's really the pioneer there. And a lot of it actually starts in the fight over the Clinton health care plan. And I do wonder sometimes, I think, you know, the people who who were the architects of the Affordable Care Act, and there's different kinds of architects, right? I mean, there's policy intellectuals, there's strategists. Um, you know, I think the strategists in particular were not naive about the opposition they would face. Um, that said, I don't think they fully appreciated the depth of it or how, how much it could consume the entire party. There was this hope all along that there was a small, uh, you know, remaining core, or remaining group within the Republican Party that was not signing up for this, that was still more of the old statesman model, you know, the moderates, the people who made deals. Who there, and, and, and in fact, the 90s thing, I mean, it's interesting because if you go back to the Clinton plan, I mean, one of the sort of after action conclusions they came to was actually there was in 1993 a, a core group of concert Republicans who seemed interested. And had they reached out to them earlier, they might have come to a deal. And in fact, there's a scene in the book, I, you know, it, it comes much later, but it's in the early 2009 and Rahm Emanuel, who's the chief of staff, and of course was, I think more than anyone in the White House kind of carried the scars of the Clinton fight because he was political director in the Clinton White House. Um, he's interviewing Nancy Ann Parle, who's gonna end up coming on board to run the healthcare effort. And he says to her, he says, you know, they were talking about what they think they got wrong in 1993, because she, she had actually worked in the Clinton administration also. And he says, I wanna, let's pinky promise that next time around, we won't, we, won't, we won't fail to engage the Republicans early enough. And I think there was a sense that they knew this beast was out there, right? They knew this, animal, but I think they still thought there was enough room to get some Republican buy-in. And of course, that was very much the lesson of the Massachusetts reforms, which, which, which were so important, as important, I think, as the Clinton reforms. Okay. So, and we should say, so uh, going forward or backwards at this point to 2007, I distinctly remember that campaign. It was sort of fascinating. You had three major candidates, uh, you know, uh, by January, uh, Edwards, uh, Clinton, and Obama. And the you could barely slide a piece of paper between them when it came to, they all signed out. I think it was hackers, right? It was Jacob hackers uh, plan. And you could slide, you couldn't slide a piece of paper between them in terms of, of the difference in the way that they um, signed on to that one plan. The only difference as far as I remember was uh, Clinton was for the mandate and Obama was not for the mandate. Um, and, uh, but they were all, Everybody was on board. Everything else was the same, as far as I recall. And there was still, you had the left was still pushing Medicare for all, but it was almost like the three front runners had congealed and like, we're going to agree to this. We're, we've already boxed out Medicare for all or single payer. I think, you know, we referred to it at that time. Um, and uh, we're going forward with it. They all basically ran on the exact same uh, healthcare plan. And on some level, though, that's what but it gave it the impetus to actually happen on some level, it feels like. Yeah, uh, th th that consensus, which really existed, I mean, it really gelled in 2006. Um, and, and it was a combination, again, of these principles they'd all agreed on on what they'd gotten wrong, and then Mitt Romney in Massachusetts signing a plan like that and it becoming law. And, and I can't understate, I can't overstate, I cannot. It was very important. <laughs> um, it, was in, it, it, it weighed heavily on everybody. Every Democrat saw that. And they saw that there was a Republican governor signing it. They saw that the Heritage Foundation had scholars praising it. They saw Ted Kennedy, patron saint of universal coverage, standing on the podium next to Romney. It was like, okay, this is how we're gonna do it. And of course that didn't come out of nowhere. That, that plan had grown, had the, the same people, many of the same people working on that were the same people who were writing in the journals and people like Jonathan Gruber, the economist from uh, Massachusetts and you get to 2007, they're all on the same page. And the liberals are mostly on the same page too. I mean, remember, Ted Kennedy is, you know, very liberal. I and mean, Ted Kennedy would love to have a single payer system, but Ted Kennedy 
says, you know what, I, you know, I, we're not going to get that. This is the best we can do. Um, I think there are two factors in terms of the left boxing out, getting, you know, boxing out Medicare for all. The first is uh, they did have this public option idea, which was from Jacob Hacker, which was very much meant to be a kind of recognition that this is not the kind of plan most liberals would like. But by doing a public option, we kind of get our foot in the door here. We sort of have like a demonstration version of a single payer and hopefully over time it grows. So number one, there was that. Uh, but number two, I, 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 I think the psychology, we, we, we've been talking about the effect of the Clinton plan in terms of policy levers. Okay, do this, don't do that, structure your taxes this way, whatever. The psychological effect on so many older, and I, and I do mean older Democrats, who had been working on this for their entire lives was so important. You had Ted Kennedy, who, in, 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 of course, in 2008 is you know, eventually diagnosed with, with brain cancers. Um, Henry Waxman, who's been you know warrior on healthcare his entire career, finding every little hole he can to expand Medicaid or whatever. All these guys who, who were liberals who would have wanted to do Medicare for all if it was up to them, or even Obama, who always described himself as a single payer guy, but Obama's younger. All of them just saying, you know, Waxman, Kennedy, um, uh, uh, John Dingell, from, who was my congressman in Michigan, uh, recognizing this may be our last shot. We don't want, you know, we're going to take a second, third, fourth, fifth best solution. And for better or worse, right? I mean, the, the, the bad news is you did, you locked out Medicare for all. I mean, that was not, for all intents and purposes, was not even in the conversation. The benefit was they were united. They were ready to go. And there was really very little daylight between, you know, again, Ted Kennedy, very liberal and Max Baucus, the very conservative Sen you know, Senate finance chairman, were basically in the same place. And all three candidates, like you said, were in this, you know, John Edwards, people forget about John Edwards, who was actually the first one to do a plan, John Edwards, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama. The only meaningful difference between them was, as you said, that Obama had a mandate for kids, but not adults. Hillary had a mandate. And, and, and I will say as someone, you know, we, I covered that, you know, remember, we spent months writing yeah. about that difference. Yeah. And, you know, it is a sort of, I, I look back and like, okay, maybe that wasn't such an important difference after all. Um, all right. One thing you mentioned, Waxman, the, the, the story you tell with Waxman and Dingle, I, I, I found that fascinating because it's one of those situations where it, you, you forget the, like, they're, like, you know, legacy decisions and construct and, and interests and this and that always have I, it's not even unintended consequences because there was no intention of consequence in that just to, but talk about you know what waxman ran into on the energy and commerce committee i mean how he replaced dingle and 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 how dingle had already had sort of um had gotten people on there that would were inadvertently hostile to what waxman was doing yeah yeah so so dingle like kennedy uh is a longtime champion of universal coverage his father John Nichols Sr. is the author of what's considered the first really serious bill in Congress in the 1940s to create a universal health care plan. And, and every, you know, he, he's, 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 he's passionate about this. He's the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over health care. It also has jurisdiction over uh, energy policy. Um, John Dingell from Michigan, the auto industry. I say that as someone who lives in his old district, uh, you, know, the, you know, that he uh, on climate, you know, he had a mix, you know, his record was mixed over the years. I think he, he did, you know, back some environmental measures, but certainly when it came to like emissions, you know, he was an ally of the auto industry fighting against people who wanted to lower emissions, you know, and, and sort of put new rules on the auto uh, uh, industry. Who was leading that fight? Henry Waxman, who was also on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Now you get to 2008 and Waxman wants to be decides to challenge Dingle for the committee. And there were a lot of reasons why, you know, the, these challenges, there's, there's personalities, whatever, Dingle had been there for a while. Uh, Waxman ends up winning and he, you know, winning in, and, and, and uh, becomes the chairman of the committee. And so as they're writing the Affordable Care Act, his, he's, he's presiding over these committee hearings, but he's got a committee that, you know, Dingle as the committee chair had put a lot of people on the committee who he knew would be allies on these environmental policies. So they're a little more conservative well, these folks, now they're doing healthcare. Waxman is trying to push a more liberal version of healthcare reform. And, and, and these conservatives are pushing back. And it really, we really see the kind of conflict come into play over what we were talking about before, which is the public option. Henry Waxman really wants a public option. You know, he, he's a believer in it. He, he would love to get to single payers someday. And, but he's got to get this thing out of committee and he doesn't have the votes. 
Um, and it's not, and you can't say, well, just go, you know, bypass the committee or something. Cause among other things, that committee is a pretty good proxy for what the house democratic caucus as a whole looks like. So, I mean, he, if he can't get it through his committee, Nancy Pelosi is going to have a real hard time getting the full bill, um, to top things up, to make things more complicated. Uh, people forget this about the early Obama administration. They say, why weren't they more ambitious about things? They were very ambitious, right? They did a big, what was considered a big stimulus at the time. And then they didn't just do healthcare. They were trying to do climate. Also, they had a cap and trade bill they were trying to push through. And the House passed that bill with Obama and Pelosi and Waxman twisting arms, you know, lobbying hard. Well, here comes along healthcare now in the Energy and Commerce Committee and suffice to say, a lot of these conservative Democrats who weren't happy about that, they're in no mood to play nice on the public option. And so basically, that forces Waxman, when he gets the bill out of, to get his bill out of committee, he has to bargain away a lot of things. And one of them is that the, he does get a public option, but it's a really weak version of one. I mean, very scaled back. Um, and that is, of course, a precursor for what's going to happen later in the process when eventually they're actually going to just drop it all together. Okay. So, uh, I, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, just that dynamic in and of itself, like, uh, it tells like uh, almost like the, so many lessons that come out of that. But when you say like these guys were, and, and, and I, I feel like, you know, when we jump over to the Senate, we start talking about Joe Lieberman, like this comes in, this is like, I think contemporaneously when I realize like, oh my God, I can't believe it. That, that these guys are making decisions on some really petty stuff in their mind, like for petty reasons in my mind that have massive implications to for millions of people and the trajectory of the country in many respects. So when you say like, okay, so the cap and trade is there. And, and I think that was around the time Joe Manchin famously shot it, the bill with a semi-automatic weapon in an advertisement in a, in a right. campaign ad. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, just uh, to remind people. And so people are feeling like, is it, is it that their, their donors on that committee are getting at them? Or are they just like, you know what? I've gone to bat for you. I mean, I always have a certain amount of donor pressure and my tolerance to go back and make extra calls and find other donors or my fear that they're going to come after me is such that I'm not willing to do this for you because you've already asked too much for me. Like the favor's got to flow both ways. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, is, it, I, is I, it that petty? So I'll say, so first of all, I, I, I try to be really careful and I tried in the book to be really careful about this also, not to sort of state what motives were people because I can't see into people's heads. You know, I never know. My sense, and, and I don't know what your sense is and I'd be interested to hear this, but my sense having covered politics this many years now, um, is that it will vary from individual to individual, and everybody's got a bunch of motives going on. So if you're let's let's take a, 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 a you know a prototypical you know conservative Democrat in the House in 2009, you know who is resisting the public option. Now, what are the possible reasons? Well, it could be they're they're a, you know they are I philosophically conservative. They think big government is bad. The market is good. They think this is an intrusion. They have a more practical version of that, which is G. The way the public option works, and the reason it seems like such an appealing idea is that it pays less to the hospitals and it pays less to the drug makers. I think that's actually bad for innovation. That's bad for, you know, it, it, it's gonna cost jobs. Uh, a, a more parochial version of that is, huh, that hospital in my district, <laughs> that CEO just visited me. Uh, he told me he's gonna lay off a bunch of people. And by the way, all his friends aren't gonna give me money. And by the way, the American Hospital Association is gonna spend five, you know, you know, $10 million on an ad buy in my district fighting me. Or, you know, then there's a whole other political concerns is, well, you know, truth be told, I think this makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, have you looked at my district lately? I'm in a Republican leaning district. My voters have already been told that public option is like socialized medicine and they will never get their cure for cancer. I can't be seen voting for this and I can't be seen lining up for something that Henry Waxman, oh my God, Henry Waxman or Ted Kennedy or Nancy Pelosi likes. So, or, <laughs> you know, or, you know, that president who's, I have a lot of conservative white constituents and that president who is not white backs and I can't do that either. And, and you know, you could any mix of these, I think, and, and then you do get into the petty stuff. I think, you know, again, I, I you know, the, I think we see a lot of this when we get to the Senate potentially. And again, I can't see into anybody's brain, but you sort of look at the interplay between leadership and a few senators in particular, and you do start to wonder how much of that got personal. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it, 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 any given person has all of those elements in, in it. It's just a question of one person has, you know, a little bit more green, another uh, has a little more blue, a little more has like a red, and that's the color yeah. that comes out when yeah. they when they vote. Um, all right, so let's, um, and, and just to be clear, on the public option, the public option would have applied, and, and, and just so that people know when we talk about the ACA, because I think there's still, you know, I, I mean, I think there's a presumption that everybody knows, but the ACA has really three comp major components. One is the patient protection part of the bill. It was officially the PPACA. Personally, I think that was the biggest mistake they ever made because they delivered on the PP part. They didn't deliver on the ACA part, uh, frankly. Like the patient protections, that's what Nancy Pelosi, that's what they ran on in 2018, pre-existing conditions. These are all the protections that are in the bill. And then there's the, so there's the patient protections, there's the exchange, which at any time only was going to affect the maximum projections were something like 20, 30 million Americans. And then the 20 or 30 million Americans who would have been, who would have gotten expansion of Medicaid, presuming that you didn't have lunatics as governors in, in uh, you know, whatever it was, uh, a dozen more uh, states. And so for the vast majority of people, in this country, it wouldn't have had really much implication, except for the public option might have, right? So it depends on which iteration you're talking about. Right. So I mean, when when Jacob Hacker, who you mentioned here for your listeners and and, and viewers, is is a uh, you know he's a he's a professor at Yale who studies the sort of history of healthcare and and got very involved in crafting policy. His original suggestion was that a, a public option would be a sort of government plan open to anybody. Now, by the time we get to 2007, 2008, that's already been downsized a lot. They've already sort of said, um, no, it's just, at least for now, it'll just be open to people buying coverage on their own through the exchanges. And, and again, this is very tied into the Clinton don't mess with people's health. You know, it doesn't matter if you're offering a better alternative, just you got to be able to say to people with employer coverage, we're not going to take away your coverage. And so that's how that got downsized. And then as it went through the process, it got sort of chipped away, like the features of it, et cetera, until by, and then at the end, they get rid of it altogether. Um, the original iteration though, it would have been available to any, anybody. And that is very much still in play right now. When you look at some of the proposals, uh, you know, I think we're a ways from having the votes for those, but you know, in terms of what you see getting talked about within the Democratic Party, there's a lot of new interest in something that would be open to everybody. That's Medicare for all who want it, essentially. Basically, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. some iteration of that. Yes. Okay, so let's let's jump over to the Senate. What, what do you think about that with the PP ACA uh, dichotomy? Like they sold it on the affordability, and it never delivered really on that, but it did deliver for every American. The idea that there's no rescission, the idea there's no lifetime caps or yearly caps, the idea that there's no pre-existing conditions, the idea that you can be on your uh, policy until you're 26, you know, your parents' policy till you're 26. And these are all things that people were material benefits for people that ended up being, when they tried to repeal it, the the go-to that um, the Democrats would talk about. I mean, particularly pre-existing conditions. So I would, I would. I would qual I don't know if I would qualify that. I have a slightly different take on that. So I agree with the first part about the protection part. And I think that's been, it's been uh, a politically like a home run, right? I mean, you see that now Republicans bending over backwards. We, we support pre-existing, you know, protecting people with pre-existing conditions. That's like the, that is the surest sign that that like, that is a Rubicon that's been crossed now and we're not going back. Um, so, you know, unless the Supreme Court decides to throw it out. That's another story. Uh, but um, so I agree with all of that. On the affordability part, I think it, 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 is, it would be my take is that it delivered on affordability for a lot of people, but not for everybody. And there's a large number of people who didn't. And I certainly, you know, in the book, I tried to be, I bend over backwards really to talk about the people who, who still don't have health, affordable insurance. And that includes people who had what they thought was affordable coverage before you know, because, you know, their plans were super cheap. Now those plans, I would tell you, you, you know, if you look at it, you'd say those plans were super cheap because you couldn't get them with a pre-existing condition. And if you got real sick, you were in trouble. But, you know, if you stayed healthy, you didn't know that and it got you paid your doctor bills. But I do think, you know, as much time as was spent on that, and I think politically it was a huge issue. And I think it's a very real inadequacy failing of the Affordable Care Act. 
you do have to weigh that against the fact that a ton of people, even in the exchanges, are saving, are got much cheaper coverage, especially because of the way the law is structured is you get to kind of the middle, lower middle end uh, of, you know, people who are getting a lot of tax credits. I mean, the coverage they're getting in a lot of cases are, is, is quite affordable with low cost sharing. And then of course, the, the Medicaid part, like it gets forgotten. I mean, it was so, it got so little attention in 2009 and 2010. And it's been huge and amazing. The biggest problem, as you said, is that you got a bunch of Republican officials blocking it in states. But, you know, that's been, you know, we, we you know, first it was sort of moderate Republican governors like in Ohio and Michigan, Arizona, they sort of embraced it and it came to those states. Now we're seeing in the states that are holding out like ballot petitions. I mean, Idaho, they got right. Medicaid expansion because the voters want it. You know, Florida, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, those states still don't have it. Uh, literally millions of people could get insurance, but you know, it's getting there. I guess, I guess my point was the, if you're in the exchanges, you're saving money, you're getting the subsidies up to 400%. They're right. talking about, and I think in this COVID relief bill, they're actually like raising that threshold. I'm not sure what the number is. Maybe we don't know yet, but, uh, but it's going to be over 400%. You're going to be eligible subsidies, but then you're only talking about, you know, like I say, 20 or 30 million people tops who would be available for that. Everybody else has still got their employer-based coverage. And they're like that the affordable part didn't apply to me, but the, but the patient protection applied to everybody and they never sold that part. They dropped the PP from the name and the Medicaid was completely undersold. It seems to me. And like, do you have a sense of why they did that? Just because, you know, affordability, they knew that affordability was important, but there was never even a plan other than maybe broadly, slightly bending the curve of everybody's cost of healthcare. There was no plan to really sort of like provide a material, something that I could look at and say, there was never even, it was never even contemplated that somebody on employer-based healthcare coverage would look at their bill and say like, hey, my insurance is cheaper. (laughs) Like you could say, my insurance didn't go up at the rate of increase that it did in the past five years, but you would never say my insurance is cheaper. And so you didn't like, there was no way unless you follow this stuff to know that yeah. what they meant by affordable. Yeah, well, so, I mean, this goes back to the original decision they made. You can't change what you don't change. If you're not gonna mess with employer coverage, you know, you're not gonna take it away from people and you can reassure them that way. But it also means you're not giving them something obvious as a benefit. Um, there are lots of ways to deliver savings to people who had employer coverage, but they all involve changing employer coverage, which, you know, now you're back. It's, it's like a, you go back to rule number one, don't mess with employer coverage. Um, I think that's why, to some extent, going forward, I mean, it's interesting. I think there's more interest in doing something on employer coverage now. I mean, you know, Bernie Sanders makes this point all the time. He's very good at this. You know, he says, People say you can't change your employer coverage. Who likes their employer coverage? So I think that conversation is shifting. That said, the reality is, if you look at the polling, we've still, I think, got a ways to go because people are scared of change. I mean, that's, that, that works left, right. It's, all, it just, it's, an, it's, it's just the case. And so, yeah, I mean, they kind of got stuck. I do think the Biden administration, you look at their plans, they are trying to figure out ways that they can get help to people with employer coverage. And you're going to see some of that happen if they can get it through Congress. Um, and there, you know, some of it is like, we're going to work on the price of prescription drugs separately. And, you know, if we, if we can do this public option, I mean, they do have this one, it, it doesn't get a lot of attention, but one of Biden's ideas was to say, you know, previously, one of the reasons you couldn't get a better deal uh, if you weren't had employer coverage was if you had an employer option, you weren't eligible for subsidies. So like, let's say your employer plan costs, you know, so much money and you're looking over and given your income, you could get a better deal buying insurance over here on the exchange. You couldn't get that better deal. You weren't eligible for it. Biden wants to tear that down. Now that will get complex and it will cost money and it will have effects on employer coverage. So we'll be back into that very debate, but you know, that's, you know, that's one way to do it. Well, so what's so what's your sense of of the public option fight going forward here? Because we have seen that the Biden administration kind of learned at least some lessons from what we saw in the Obamacare fight, right, where they're yeah. just going to pass this one point nine trillion dollar stimulus through reconciliation without any Republican votes. There were zero Republican votes on this bill in the House. And so there are going to be multiple reconciliation attempts, although that's limited. 
Do you sense that the Biden administration is going to to fight for a public option in any way? I mean, I would imagine that it would be at least a year or, or two down the line after we've kind of gotten through this pandemic. Um, what's your sense on the lessons that his Democratic Party has learned and, and the Biden administration specifically on dealing with Republicans on this issue? Yeah, um, you know, it's hard to know. I say there's sort of factors pushing in either direction. So on the one hand, um, Going through a pandemic does tend to focus the mind on healthcare, right? So, I mean, I think there's a sense that uh, they need to do something aggressive on healthcare, even beyond what they're doing with the COVID bill, what beyond what they're doing with uh, the, the the regulations they can change. Um, politically, the progressive wing of the party is louder, more organized. Uh, it's got more information at its disposal. They are going to push in that direction. And I think the Biden administration has a very good sense of that flank of the party. They, they I think they feel... Even if they wanted to stiff it, I think they, they, they would know they can't. Um, uh, I think as a policy lesson, I think a lot of the people working on healthcare policy who were a little dismissive of the idea of a public option in the past are now coming around to the idea as a good idea. So that all pushes in the direction of yes, they would do it. Um, you know, the flip side is, uh, I, I, you know, number one, there's, a, there's priorities, right? You know, and there's only so many places you're gonna have a knockdown fight. Um, are they gonna put a public option above minimum wage? Are they going to put it in front of climate change, in front of infrastructure? I kind of don't think so. And now you've kind of, you know, there's only so much bandwidth and only so much time. Um, and well, it seems like the minimum wage fight is at least is at least delayed, if not, I don't know. I mean, given up on in, in some fashion, given what the parliamentarian ruled on, but but maybe, I don't know. Right. Right. I mean, at best, right. I mean, if, if they're going to come back to it, it's going to have to be a whole new fight right now. It's going to have to be separate from the COVID bill. So, I mean, that's yeah. that's a month or that's two months. So, you know, I think there's a question of the priorities. Biden himself is kind of interesting in that, you know, he's never been a healthcare person. I mean, you can go back and look at his 2008 campaign. He was like one of, you know, the Hillary Clinton, John Edwards, Barack Obama, very all in on healthcare. You know, Biden was like, yeah, I'll do it. I mean, just not his thing. It's just not his passion. It hasn't been. And he was actually among the advisors, and he had plenty of company, among the advisors urging Obama in late 2008, early 2009, not to do an aggressive push on healthcare because he thought it'd be such a political quagmire, which to be fair, it was. Uh, um, but, you know, I do think just listening to him, watching him, knowing his, uh, his feelings about uh, uh, caregiving and having dealt with, you know, uh, his son's experience with cancer. That does seem to have like tuned him in more. I mean, I do think he seems to be thinking about healthcare more and of course the pandemic. So I think it really is hard to know. I, you know, I think a lot of it's going to be the political pressure from the progressive wing of the party. How much do they you know, want this? And I assume the progressive wing of the party, for them, it's going to be a calculation based in part on what else they're seeing. I mean, if you know, Biden's all in on a Green New Deal, they'll probably cut him a lot of slack on health care. If he's not doing anything on the Green New Deal, then I think they're going to put more pressure on, uh, on, on a public option. One of the things that came out in your conversation with, with Obama as you, as you did the reporting for the, for the, the, the book, the, the concept, and, and I remember this you know, contemporaneously, the, the idea was like, look, we pass the thing, it becomes like Medicare, you know, which wasn't Medicare day one. It took a while to evolve, but it becomes so embraced by the American public that there's no resistance to it. And then you can come in, you can do the technical fixes. And that was the plan. And that all seemed to me to be part of Barack Obama and that administration's sort of like lack of awareness of who the Republican Party had become or what the Republican Party had become at that point. Um, and, and I think he's expressed, you know, surprised. Do you think that that lesson has been internalized by the, these people who, who, you know, these policy political people that like, look, if we're going to do something, we're going to pay a big price regardless, you know, and you could say the same thing about the stimulus, right? Like, all right, you got to say it wasn't a trillion dollars, but so what? Because they said it was a trillion dollars. Like, I mean, do you think that lesson has been learned? Like, we, if we're going to go, you know, I mean, it's sort of Machiavelli, right? If you're going to do the king uh, uh, an injury, you, do, you, you make sure they don't get up from it. I mean, do you think that has been uh, uh, internalized or no? 
I mean, I sort of feel like sometimes, some days I think it has. I mean, this is what I think Emma was talking about earlier when she talked about the fact that they're going to reconciliation and they're not waiting for Republicans around. I mean, it certainly seems, I mean, you, you listen to that, you see that decision, you think, okay, these guys have, have figured it out. But, you know, I'm not 100% sure in that, you know, I, I, I always, it's always hard to know when they're talking about these things publicly, what's for show and what's they, what is they really think. I mean, to some extent, it makes political sense if you're Joe Biden or you're an official of the administration, you, there, 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 there's a value in saying, I'm open to working with the Republicans. I would like to work with the Republicans. I mean, just if there's no cost to that, right? If you could just say that, right. that has political virtue. There's lots of people and voters who like to hear that. Um, it, you know, in an ideal world, you would like to get a couple of votes from Lisa Murkowski or Mitt Romney on a child allowance or whatever. You know, something I think that uh, Max Baucus was a big believer in, I think Obama too, and I don't think they're wrong about this, which is that all else equal, if you could do a bill where you get Republican buy-in, that's great, because then it's more politically resilient going forward. Um, the hard thing is, of course, you and I know, we all now know, Obama now knows that like this Republican party is just not constitutionally capable of that. I mean, occasionally you find a member, whether it's a Murkowski or a Romney, who will stand up for this issue or that issue, or you know, on Romney on impeachment, for example. And 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 I actually am not surprised that Romney did that, given his history. I did a lot of Romney in my book, as you know, going back to his past. Um, but you know, that's not who the Republican Party is right now. And there are even the ones who I think have some genuine interest in being more bipartisan or, 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 or sort of governing in that sort of high-minded way are just under enormous pressure not to do that. So, you know, I don't, I, I guess I'm optimistic that they've learned that lesson, but it's, it's hard to be sure. And, you know, the other, the, the, the other thing to remember is I think just, I, I do try to remind people of this, and I think this is a dynamic we saw in the Affordable Care Act fight. I think it's a dynamic we see right now on the COVID fight it's not just about the Republicans, right? It's about those conservative Democrats. It's, 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 those, it's that 59th and 60th vote if you're in a filibuster world, or it's the 49th and the 50th vote if you're in a non-filibuster world. You know, the conversations with Joe Manchin sure sound a lot like the conversations with Ben Nelson 10 years ago to get him as the last vote on health care. And, you know, they're dealing with a whole complex set of incentives, right? I mean, does Joe Manchin, you know, Joe Manchin... Does he just want to stick it to the Democratic leadership? Does he generally have conservative views? Or does he actually really want to be a team player, but he's in a state that voted for Trump by 30 points? Um, I will say this, just my, I, I really never interviewed Joe Manchin, so I, my insights to him are based on what I've seen and read. But I look at Joe Manchin and I look at Joe Lieberman, I think I'd much rather be dealing with Joe Manchin, who you couldn't know. agree more. I, I've made this. Assessment. I've made this exact point Absolutely. a bunch of times. Yes. Lieberman had, you know, a lot of uh, money behind him trying to kill certain things. Manchin has more of a brand, I think, that he's going to sell. All yeah. right. Well, Jonathan, oh, we could talk about this. I, 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 and, and I'd love to catch up with you again about it because it's fascinating. Uh, the book uh, is The Ten Year War, Obamacare and the Unfinished Crusade for Universal Health Care. We will put a link to it at uh, majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Really, that was, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on your show. All right, folks, quick break. We'll be right back. Uh, Emma, I, I hope uh, you forgive me for that. Uh, it was like uh, walking down memory lane uh, with Jonathan. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, all, it was very informative. Uh, I mean, I the the those battles, uh, it all came back to me, and I think it gave me hives. Um, just even <laughs> uh, raising the idea of Joe Lieberman, who um, kept every like it got to the point where people were saying like, well, maybe if the you know they would call them liberals or the left or the left flank of the Democratic Party pushed this as a head fake to Joe Lieberman, he would be against that. You know, maybe if we came out against the public option, Joe Lieberman would be like, let's do it. I mean, he was that, that type of guy. Uh, but we will, uh, we will catch up with more uh, tomorrow. Um, we're out of time.
We will see you tomorrow. Did you call me Martha? What? No. Uh, okay. In the chat, I said, because we, we had limited time, I said, got to be quick. Got to be quick, Martha. That's that's my one of my favorite moments from the Trump presidency with Martha McSally. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Got to be Get quick. Up. Quick. Yeah. Quick. No Get one up. cares. Yeah. No one cares what you have to say. Quick, quick, Martha. Um, so, folks, we're going to head into the uh, fun half of the program, and um, Nomi will be joining us. Just a reminder, this program relies on your support. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you support the free show. You get uh, more content in the fun half. You also get the free show free of commercials. I mean, what could be better? Um it's your, your support that makes it possible. Also, uh, check out just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. You get 10% off. And don't forget the AM Quickie, available at amquickie.com or wherever you get your podcast. And today on the Nomi Key Show. Hello. Today on the Nomi Key Show, we have the one and only Ben Dixon. Yay. Ah. Very fun. It's been a while. Buddy Ben. And then later we have Joshua Khan Russell and Lance from the Surfs. Uh, it's a very broy day. Very broy day. Very uh, broy day. Start off your week. The inverse of the majority report. Very, like yin well, and yang. Yeah, there you go. There you go. It, yeah. it takes all types, folks. And so um, uh, check that. What time does that uh, your show play, Nomi? It starts at three p.m. Eastern, uh, right here on the YouTube's and on Twitch at twitch.tv uh, slash the underscore Nomi Key underscore show. Very catchy. It's really flowing. And on the yeah. Patreon. <laughs> uh, also, don't forget, um, uh, check out the Antifada. They're doing three Twitch streams a week at twitch.tv slash the Antifada, as well as uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada. Uh, and Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian uh, <laughs> media universe? Uh, yeah, I talked to historian Peter Linbaugh about his new book, Red Round Globe Hot Burning, about the age of the enclosure of the commons, resistance to that enclosure, and how it coincides with the Anthropocene and climate destruction. So uh, check that interview out. It came out last week, Thursday, on the Left Reckoning YouTube channel, which you should go subscribe to. Um, I understand that you, uh, that you uh, blushed during that uh, interview. You were so you were so nervous. I wouldn't. Well, if that would get people to go watch the interview, then yes, I blush That's uh, during the, the interview. You do it, man. You no, gotta, Matt. You gotta, Matt, you gotta Matt threw up. up. Matt threw up actually. So everyone's got to tune in to see that. Yeah, it was like the Jordan flu game, but with my nervousness. And so it's me talking to Peter Limbaugh. <laughs> All right, folks. We'll take a quick break. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty is the number. Quick. We will see, see you. Quick, in Martha. The fun half, Martha. <laughs> Is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice. Today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. 
Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you. You fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Ooh. Let's let's I wanna just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me, hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the majority report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Nomi, how are you? I'm fabulous. Yeah, just <laughs> living my best living pandemic your best, life. Uh, pandemic life. That's, that's how are you life. guys doing? <laughs> just hanging like on. A... Everybody's white knuckled. I feel white knuckled these yeah, days. Yeah, this was a, a like a Tuesday where it felt more like whew, it's just yeah, the Friday. end of the week. I almost yeah. like literally yeah. almost introduced the show today. It's like it is Thursday, please. <laughs> that's so funny. I said yesterday it was Wednesday. Yeah. So something's so starting to lose it. This uh, report from CNN is, I mean, uh, CNN, you put up, uh, put it up, uh, will you, uh, Brandon? The um, CNN is reporting that you have um, the White House is working. Oh, gosh. The point with Chris oh, Lizzo. It, really ev- it seems existing? like Ooh, every exciting. art, every CNN article I click on, I'm, I'm like, damn it, I'm reading Chris Lizzo's article. So yeah. Murkowski is uh, apparently, she is apparently looking to negotiate her support for Neera Tandon. Oh my god. <laughs> um, and is now, I, I, you know, when it's phrased this way that she seeks the White House attention on uh, Alaskan economic concerns. Part of that is Anwar. Uh, look, I mean, I don't mind them saying, here's some, you want some infrastructure in the next bill? Great, you got it. Um, but while you're there, um, how about not making it for near attendance sake? How about making it for the sake of a $15 minimum wage? Exactly. Um, I mean, now again, we don't know. Is this something that the White House is doing or right. is this something that Murkowski is floating so that they come to her? I mean, right. so, you know, reserve judgment, but it will be. And, and I it's possible and it certainly would be extremely clarifying. We just spoke to Jonathan Coney. He's like, you know, you never know if they're saying stuff publicly, if they believe it or are they saying it for the sake of other people. Um, if they negotiate some type of deal with Murkowski. To get to save near attendance um, nomination when they basically just walk away from the $15 minimum wage without attempting anything. And uh, if that negotiation includes drilling, well, right, of course, Arctic I mean, National yes. Wildlife Refuge, that's what she wants. Right? That's one or of the near things. That, one of the things on her list. Here is Jen Psaki yesterday. She is the um, White House um, communications uh, chief. Chief. Uh, White House, uh, and this is the White House press room. She is asked about um, the $15 minimum wage and what the administration will and will not fight on. On a parliamentary decision, you said that he respects that decision, but progressives don't understand this. In some respect, they're like, why not fight for this? So why is the White House not more aggressively challenging that and sending the vice president to try and potentially overrule that with the vote. 
Well, uh, the the decision for a vice, the vice president to uh, vote to overrule or to take a step to overrule is not a simple decision. Uh, it would also require 50 votes. Pause it for uh, one second. Know, it's not Pause a it for one second. I want to clarify something. I'm going to give her the the. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be the most charitable I can be here. That what she's referring to is once the vice president overrules the advice of the parliamentarian understand this is just an advisory like what is the problem i mean i you know uh i i know a little something about robert's rules parliamentarian does not have any power the parliamentarian just gives you advice they're a consigliari if you will of the senate and my advice is no this doesn't comport if the vice president overrules it then takes 60 votes to overrule the vice president. The only time you need 50 votes is when it's an actual vote on the bill. And, not, and by bill, I don't mean the $15 minimum wage. I mean the $1.9 trillion COVID package. Right. So when they say you need 50 votes, the implication is Kristen Sinema, Joe Manchin, anybody Danny Democrat is going to vote against the entire right. $1.9 right. trillion dollar bill. Now they may be pissed because they got jammed, but they got jammed. But all right, let's continue. Overrule is not a simple decision. Uh, it would also require 50 votes. Uh, as you know, it's not a one step decision. And the president and the vice president both respect uh, the history of the Senate. Uh, they are both formally served in the Senate, the and that's not an action we intend to take. Who but I, the, history the president the is committed to raising the minimum wage, to working to determine the best vehicle forward to doing that. That's why he put it in the package. He wants it to be raised to $15 an hour, and he will be in touch with uh, leaders uh, from all wings of the party in determining the best path forward for that. Go ahead, Jeff. The follow up to Jeff's question, which, which strikes me, the, the, the White House doesn't have 50 votes to confirm Neera Tandon as OMB director, and yet, uh, we heard from the White House chief of staff say that the White House is they're going to fight their guts out, fight our That's guts right. out was the phrase he used amazing. to get her confirmed. So why push for that and not push as hard, one could say, for raising the minimum wage? You could make the argument that the American people stand to benefit more from a higher wage than they would wow. from a chosen OMB director. Who was that? Well, I think that's mixing a few things um, kind of irresponsibly, if I'm just being totally oh, honest. Okay. Um, I would say on the minimum wage, the president included a raise of the minimum wage in his package because he felt strongly that it's long overdue, that men and women working hard, trying to make ends meet, shouldn't be living at the poverty level. That's why he put it in his package. There is a process that go, it goes mm. through, a parliamentary process, it, when it's a reconciliation bill, as you know, but for people who haven't been following all the nitty gritty of this, because it's a budgetary bill. Uh, that's why it went through the process. And, uh, you know, again, I would, I would send you to talk to leaders in Congress to see if they have the 50 votes necessary. But regardless, the president, the vice president have made the decision they're not going to move forward uh, with that step. But also, it's not a simple process. It requires two steps. As it relates to Neera Tandon, she is somebody who has decades of experience. Uh, she is qualified. She is uh, prepared to lead the budget uh, right, whatever. team. We don't need to hear and, this yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. I mean, so she, she points out the nitty gritty there. That's what they're relying on. They're relying right. on the process being way too complicated for people for them to fully grasp it. And by the way, that was an NBC reporter who asked that excellent question because the contrast is clear. As we mentioned, right now, Lisa Murkowski is trying to leverage her vote for Neera Tandon to allow for certain goodies for Alaska, including, in her mind, drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which Biden put a halt to. If he caves on that in order to get Tandon's vote for OMB and then does nothing on the $15 minimum wage, that question, you know, like it struck a nerve with Saki for a reason. That's why she was like, I'm basically offended by this question because they've been fighting way harder in order to 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 pay off the Clinton wing uh, of the Democratic Party and give them some red meat than to actually fight on fifteen dollar minimum wage in this bill. Well, and if you want to kill something, put it through a process, make it complicated. Right. That's like the, old, the oldest trick in the book. And Democrats are great at that. You know, he'll fight tooth and nail for near, near a tannin. I mean, what's frustrating to me about this is it's not like he's the effing president and he can just pick up the phone and start hustling for those 50 votes. That's what's offensive about what she said there. Anytime they want to distance something, it's because of the votes. It's because of the dynamics. It's because of parliamentary procedure. But 
he's on the phone making calls for Nero Tandon. I mean, it's just so blatantly obvious. I, I think. Well, I, I mean, here's the thing. Like I, I, I and this is, this is my charitable view. You, you, you nominate somebody, I wouldn't have nominated her, but you nominate somebody. So at the very least, it's important for you to pay lip service that you're going to fight for them, right? I mean, because you don't want anybody to feel like, oh, I'm not going to sign up for that. I'm going to go into a meat grinder, not going to fight for me. You, you pretend like you're going to fight for them. We'll see. We'll see about all that. But what is clear is she is definitely being purposefully uh, obtuse about what's involved in the parliamentarian, uh, uh, you yes. know, in, in overruling the parliamentary. It is not a two-step process any more than actually passing the bill is a two-step right. process. It is a one-step process. And if they attempt to stop it, it's on them. The burden is on the people who want to overrule the vice president. There doesn't have to be a 50 person vote. That's a vote for the That's entire right. bill, which is going to happen one way or another. So, I mean, that's a little bit disingenuous. And she was very careful not to make it sound, she said, and then you have a 50 a person vote. Well, yes, that's the vote on the bill, but that's not a vote on the decision okay. to overrule uh, the parliamentarian. Now, yeah. I do think that to be fair, the difference between overruling the parliamentarian is that it's a, you know, it is not something that is particularly common. The idea of fighting for somebody who is nominated, that is more common. And there are risks. She doesn't get into this. There are risks associated with overruling the parliamentarian. The last time the Republicans did it, Jim Jeffords switched over, became a Democrat um, or an independent, I think, but ended up caucusing with the Democrats yeah. and uh, from Vermont. And so there's, you know, I don't know if Joe Manchin would do that or not. I don't know if he would threaten that he would do it and just bluff or who knows. But there are risks. People should be aware of that. But the idea that they, you know, the fact that she doesn't want to lay out exactly what's involved with this indicates that they are worried about the heat they're taking about it. 100%. And and, oh, go on, Sam. Well, the, you know, look, this is, I mean, if I'm Kamala Harris and I'm thinking I'm going to run for president in 2024, I'm going to be pretty upset because like you're, you're leaving me out to dry, you know, because she, you know, she doesn't, I don't think that she has any agency in this situation, really. No. I don't think that she has the ability to go like, you know, Biden, I'm doing it. I mean, she could well, say yeah. I, I mean, it do doesn't it. excuse it. But yeah, I don't think she does have agent. But the, the point, Sam, though, is like you're being you're being generous, but I also think you're being fair. But my point would be if Murkowski can uh, use her vote on Neera Tandon to leverage goodies for Alaska, certainly you could sit down with Manchin and Cinema and talk to them about this process and then maybe give them things for West Virginia and Arizona down the road in order for them to stomach overruling the parliamentarian because they're just using the parliamentarian as a shield. No matter what happens, no matter how much the White House is apparently they're whittling down, Jeff Stein is reporting that centrist Democrats want different, are still trying to push for the income threshold to be put, uh, pushed down, um, are still trying to tweak the state and local, the $350 billion, I believe, that's going to state and local to go to different infrastructure, whatever. Like, there's still a negotiation process going on. So you could, thing- use, you could use that opportunity to promise cinema and mansion something in order to keep that $15 minimum wage. So I it think goes both the, ways. the problem with Joe, Joe Manchin, uh, unlike Murkowski, is that Manchin and cinema, it's going to look so severely bad for them to vote against the $1.9 trillion package and bring pork back to their states. I mean, it, it's going to look bad for Murkowski, too. I just I just don't think I think it's something that's going to be in the ads over and over. You know, they're already targeting them uh, in their states for, you know, for, for, for not being responsive with that new PAC that's uh, Corbin Trent's PAC attacking them. I just don't think it's going to be a good look. I think they're stuck. They're going to have to vote for the package. And so Biden's trying to find a way through back doors to block the $15 minimum wage. That's my theory. I don't think it's coming from Murkowski. I think it's a Biden administration thing. And he's, they're now, working with Murkowski. That, uh, my understanding is that Bernie Sanders now has pulled the, or is going to pull in committee the $15 from the bill. <laughs> Uh, which means that there will be no sort of showdown, if you will, between the parliamentarian about it, right? The parliamentarian will not have it. You know, they get an advisory opinion and then they would get another advisory opinion if it actually showed up in the bill. Um, and he is going to uh, then offer an amendment for the $15 minimum wage. Now, um, 
what do you think about that? Because to force the vote, basically. <laughs> let's force the vote in it, but also seems to be like to what end? Like, right. I mean, if you're going to like, because Mansion and Cinema, at the very least, I think it would vote against that amendment. Um, that's all well and good. They're going to have to take that vote. And to what end? Like, how do you leverage it from there? Like, it seems to me to be like. I mean, I would rather Bernie leave it in and force the pressure up to the administration because you're going to have ongoing, like the damage that is done to the administration is not going to be so severe that they aren't going to get anything other than like, you know, that it that it's actually going to accrue to the benefit of progressives because it's like, look, you're going to take the hit for this. So the next time you try something like this, you're going to take another hit you know, from, uh, from, from progressives. So Unless they blame progressives. I, I don't know. I, I don't see it going that way. I think that they're going to say you're holding up this stimulus package because you're, you know, you're, you're fixed on this parliamentarian uh, issue and the $15 minimum wage. Well, I, that's my do that, But the $15 minimum wage is, 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 I mean, it's possible. I mean, that's possibly the thinking, but then why are you going to make mansion and uh, cinema vote against that? Because what are you going to get out of them after this? Nothing. I think it kills it. I mean, I, I'm kind of with you, Sam. I think keeping it in the bill up until the 11th hour would allow for there still to be a conversation like the one that we're having about how to leverage those votes or how to potentially, you know, get the Biden administration to, they say they're not going to overrule the parliamentarian or whatever, but um Taking it out, I guess it's more performative than anything. Next time we get a bite at $15 minimum wage, it's going to have to be through reconciliation anyway. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really just deeply disappointed in, in the Biden administration. I think that they're showing a lack of cojones. And if they're playing these games, it's actually showing a weakness in their leadership. You know, forget about progressives being disappointed. I think he looks weak. I think if in the first 100 days he doesn't go in blaring, and I mean, as a former senator, you know, channel... I don't know, Johnson, like it's just, it's weakness. It's weakness all around. You're showing your weakness to the right. You're showing your weakness to the center and you're showing your weakness to the left because you have no control over the situation and everything is through these backroom deals. Um, and reporters can just flat out call you out for it. And, and you don't know how to handle it. it. I just think it's absolute weakness for a moment when he needs to step up. Say cojones yeah. again. Cojones. I was going to say. Cojones. <laughs> I was going to say. Um, uh, tiene cojones. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> It's it. I, I mean, it, it it is. It's bad. I mean, it's bad. And they're going to come back and it's going to be what they're going to do is they're going to come back and they're going to do if they think that they can do a standalone bill for 11 bucks or 10 bucks. That's what's going to happen. Well, that's, they that's can, because now you got Tom Cotton signing off on. Oh, perfect. Let's put this to bed. No one's going to get a living wage. And then we won't address this for another like, 25 why? years. My donors will be thrilled. It's. It is, um, it is just bizarre to me. Like uh, as a, a political matter, like eleven bucks is not going to cut it. No. Now I suppose maybe they come back with like eleven bucks in a year, right? <laughs> and then you have an opportunity. I do. You know, and then you have an opportunity to maybe come back and fix it. But they're what they're doing. They're letting a little bit of air out of the tire. They're giving they're giving this issue over to the Republicans, right? Like you're not going to campaign like. We would have got you a three dollars more an hour. Well, you know, there was a lot of complications. The parliamentary, you know, like you know, it, it, you're taking this off the table as a political issue. You're demobilizing all the organizing that has gone around it. I mean, from their perspective, this might be the theory, but that's what's going to happen. They're going to end up doing like a ten or eleven buck uh, minimum raise. Maybe it'll be, you know, it'll still be like a two or three year threshold. I mm -hmm. bet a roll in, um, and. It's you're going to be in the exact same position, you know, um, uh, two years from now, they're going to sell it as like, we're going to get another bite at the apple. If we do better in the midterms, we're going to get, we can take another bite at this apple, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know. It is. Um, and more states are going to pass it. I mean, I, I'm curious that this goes the way it like, uh, you know, gay marriage went in terms of, of state by state by state passing and then finally just gets to the executive level and and he signs it's a fait accompli it. yeah i mean it could i mean that's sort of what's happening with the pot too right right but uh, it's ridiculous i mean four years ago the democratic platform committee i mean i was going back through old tapes recently and 
And to see, like, and Neera Tandon was one of the leaders on the Hillary side of the platform committee um, in the official meetings and the bigger meetings, just to see the aggressiveness against the $15 minimum wage in that room and seeing the splits between the 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 Hillary delegates and like the Hillary, you know, the, like the, the leaders that were there, the elected officials who were just um, pushing back. I mean, there was a lot of division in that room. So, I, I mean, it's... It's not like something that they campaign. I mean, Kamala Harris campaigned on it because it was popular, but we know where they are. Right. So. Uh, let's go to the phones. Uh, go. Call from a 406 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. This is BJ from Montana. BJ from Montana. What's on your mind? Um, I actually was had a couple of things you can stop me when you want. Uh, I guess my main one that I was going to ask you about was um, I'm actually legitimately scared about like Marjorie Taylor Greene and that whole faction of the right um, taking over the Republican Party. I also think someone should probably go and hang a giant portrait of a tantric sex guru outside her office. But that's besides huh. the point. That's um, pretty good. If, yeah. That's who she uh, had that affair with. So. All right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if um, <laughs> everyone's super aware of like just how much the uh, intelligence agency or I guess ex people that used to work in intelligence agencies have to do with QAnon. Um, and I know you've talked about it a little bit, but I saw a um, Twitter thread from a person named Dave Troy who shared just dozens of names of people from the NSA, CIA, who all seem to have some sort of, you know, problem. They, they kind of went maybe a little too crazy during their jobs. They got fired. Now they're mad at the CIA and NSA. And for some reason, they're just all over all the QAnon podcasts, just lighting it up with all their nonsense. Um, and it's, that's crazy. That's scary to me that, I mean, I know CIA bad and NSA bad, but like, yeah, I was going to suggest maybe they haven't really QAnon got stuff. What's that? Uh, say uh, say again, Matt. I was just going to suggest maybe they haven't really had much of a falling out with those intelligence agencies, and they're actually planted <laughs> in those movements. But I I think there's listen. I think there's there's two there's there's two explanations. I think Matt's is not. Uh, I would. Be, I mean, let me put it this way: if I was the CIA, I feel like it would be malfeasance. <laughs> or misfeasance for me not to do what Matt suggests. I mean, right. that seems pretty, that, that rat effery is, you know, pretty standard issue operations. That's what, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, what's his face? Uh, Carl Rove did that in helping George Bush's. I mean, like the, the idea of putting people out there to create these sort of like fantastical things is, is possible. The other thing you have to keep in mind is, is that I do think just statistically speaking, there are people who sort of go off the deep end um, and in every sector of, of life. And, um, you know, there are guests that I used to have. There were people who I was sort of friendly with who've gone off the deep end in this way, not CIA, but I'm saying like, there's no reason why you shouldn't have some of those people in the CIA. And sure. the difference in today is, as opposed to let's say 20 years ago is that I could set up a microphone, I could have a podcast, and that person who, you know, otherwise we wouldn't hear from is now like right there. And certainly, you know, the algorithms are such that this person is going to travel wide. So the phenomena looks more real on yeah. some level than it is. But um, so I don't know. I think it's probably both those things. But uh, as and they far probably as instigate it too. I mean, in, in, you know, there's always anytime this kind of thing happens. It's like the, the, the former CIA person or the current CIA, whatever you want to call the operative instigates something. And then the other people latch on and, and feel empowered to start their own show. And so it's a copycat syndrome or, or whatever they plan to do, like whether it's organizing on the ground or violence. Appreciate the call. Uh, let's go to call from a two one zero area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Sam, Emma, Noma Keys, John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. How are you, John? I'm good. 
Uh, a lot of long-term listeners know me as someone who has consistently promoted leftist candidates for this show for many years, but I also want to be objective about political analysis. And I want to disagree with you on some analysis you gave yesterday, Sam. At 148 in the show, you said that Never Trumpers, uh, Never Trump movement didn't have any constituency outside of the media. Well, I don't care for uh, ne the Never Trumpers opinions. I to deny that they had a major influence on the election in 2020 is, is to deny, deny reality. About a, a quor, quarter of the voters who consider themselves independent actually have strong leanings towards uh, one party. And the other half are more truly independent and can swing elections depending on the strength of, of the party's base turnout. Uh, during the Obama era, uh, Democrats uh, – political expert <coughs> mantra was if we turn out our base, we win, and that happened in presidential in presidential election years. During the midterms, the base was unmotivated and apathetic and lost badly. Uh, according to exit polls in 2016, the most important swing in the most important swing states, uh, more self-proclaimed Democrats voted uh, than Republicans. But in those same states, Trump won independent voters, and this led him to victory. In 2020, the exact opposite happened. Self-proclaimed Republicans had a higher vote total uh, uh, than, than most Republicans in most uh, important swing states, but Biden won independence by fairly wide margins. This is one of the main reasons why Biden won. Uh, in fact, in Minnesota, where John? Biden won by, by 7 point, yes. Okay. Um, if you will recall... At 1.48 p.m. yesterday, I said Eastern Time. 1.48 into the show. Oh, 1.48 into the show, which would have been approximately 1.48 p.m. Yeah, yeah, that's Eastern. right. That, that's right, Eastern Time. I Eastern said Trumpers. never Trumpers. Is that correct? Yeah. Am I a never Trumper, John? No. You know why I'm not a never Trumper? Because I am not a Republican. Because a never Trumper is a Republican who said never Donald Trump for this party of which I am part of. Ooh. And it is true that independents lean, uh, like you say, a significant number of independents tend to be loyal to one party or the other. But by being independents, they cannot be never Trumpers any more than I or you can be. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't agree with that. Because, what? I mean, what? I mean, where do you think where do you think the people who were independent that, that ended up voting for Biden, which was a mass amount of people? Uh -huh. I mean, they, I mean, how did that happen? I mean, well, no, they didn't like happened. Trump. But my point is, never Trumpers are specifically Republicans who don't like who w would never vote for Trump. That is the definition uh of what a never Trumper is. Well, a lot of never Trumpers are now Democrats. Also, they they've become it's Democrats now, but but well, in two thousand sixteen. But you know, the it's... term "never Trumper" was not about independents who didn't who would never vote for Trump or did vote for Trump and changed because they obviously were not never Trumpers. They were of they were Trumpers and then not. I mean, this is a semantic term, but I did say never Trumpers. I mean, if I had said, you know. Well, independents or Trump, you know, people who voted for Trump in 2016, but didn't vote in 2020. But I'm sorry, John, I feel like uh, there's a little bit of motivated reasoning here. Like, I agree with you that uh, Joe Biden won independence and took votes from Donald Trump that may he may have had in 2016. But a never Trumper is a never Trumper. And that those people were established in 2015 uh, and 16. So John and if Gates, you were a it's... never Trumper, you're a never Trumper. You're not like I used to be a Trumper, and now I'm not a Trumper. Yeah. You're a never Trumper. Right, but you're saying that it, they didn't have a constituency besides the media, and I'm disagreeing with that. Oh, I'm I saying... see what you're saying. You're saying that that people from the Lincoln Project are the ones who influence the independents. Well, not necessarily the Lincoln Project, but, I mean, a lot of people uh, – who actually believe in like Reagan dogma about uh, economics or about, you know, having like an imperialistic war culture and all of the other cultural ideas. I mean, it's, it's much more founded than I think that you 
realize. I mean, I, I agree that right now everything is. Do you based think those people watch control. MSNBC? Excuse me. Do you think those independents who lean Republican watch MSNBC? Yeah, some of them do, and a lot of them watch CNN also. Yeah, I'm I'm skeptical. Yeah. I'm skeptical of of that, but I understand your premise better now. You're saying that their constituency were uh, those people who, I mean, um, who who there were independents who were helped by former, you know, by by Republicans who were against Trump. And that's well, I don't it, think it's necessarily helping. I mean, I, I think the media has some influence to some degree, but I think these are just people who are Republicans. They believe in Republican philosophy and they voted for Biden. And you can see this in the midterm. And you actually agreed with this in your analysis right after the election. You were saying that the reason that, that uh, the Democrats lost seats in the house is because they didn't talk about policy yeah. enough. They, they focused on Trump and they didn't address the issues that were germane to people's well, uh, economic can, existence. Can I counter just one point here? I just think that fundamentally more, you know, while Do Donald Trump uh, got more votes than ever and, 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 and Biden got more votes than him, Biden pulled more Republicans. There were more Republicans and Republican leaning people that turned out people like I have family members who voted for Biden that are Republicans and voted Republican down ballot. They could have not showed up. Maybe in the past they didn't show up. There, I think there were a, the, the turnout was so high on the conservative side, both for anti-Trump people and for Trump people, that the anti-Trump people still voted down ballot conservative. And I don't think, actually, frankly, the issues would have swayed them. My family members wouldn't vote for a $15 minimum wage, but they voted for Biden because they thought Trump was disgusting. I, 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 my, my critique of what the Democrats did in well, not just in the, the, the general, but over the course of the four or five years, is they didn't tie the Republican Party to Donald Trump enough. Not necessarily making Donald yeah. Trump, you know, talking about Donald Trump, but talking about how they're toadies for Donald Trump. That's right. I mean, that's why I think in 2018, you saw um, uh, a similar dynamic, except for it went even more uh, well down ballot races, similar dynamic as to what you saw at the top of the, the, the ticket in 2020, happened in down ballot races in 2018 because they were the only game in town. And so people wanted to get at Trump. They, they did it by voting against their Republican lawmaker. And that theme, the Democrats should have uh, made um, um, more. I mean, they got away with it, right? With the, with the Georgia runoffs, but that was, that was basically luck and the two thousand dollar check promise. I mean, they could have not lost, you know, luck on the national Democrats scale, not in terms of Georgia, but luck for them because um, the they lost seats in the House based on that exact problem. Sam, they they said Trump was distinct from Republicans as opposed to like a part. Brendan's of it. telling me now that five thirty eight is report reported that there was not that much split ticket voting in 2020. That's probably true, uh, but he didn't win by that much either. Uh, in, in the states that he won, you know, he won by- 42,000 votes. Yeah, I mean, that's- that's Yeah, I mean, but than, that's, that's enough to make a difference. In those swing states, if you're hyper-targeting, if you're spending the billion, you know, however much money Lincoln Project spent, that's enough. I mean, that was their game all along, was hyper-focusing on those votes. But, I mean, the damage, like you said, is- would we have lost the White House if he didn't do that? And I mean, I personally feel that this country is far more conservative than we really uh, have a sense right now. And I don't know if running on the issues that we progressives stand for, because we haven't made a case for the issues because we have no effing party across the country. Well, I mean, so you need a party at, to juxtapose that. I mean, look at the $15 minimum wage in Florida. Well, yes. I mean, there's some issues, but but I'm, I mean, I'm saying like, I know Medicare for All is popular, but there there's such a branding attached to the issues that we fight for that is associated with radical progressivism that when you go out into, you know, even communities in Florida, Arizona, Virginia, West Virginia, whatever, there's no Democratic Party to make the case for it. So they uh, hear it's radical, you know, 
some of these issues, not all of and them. And the figureheads of the Democratic Party are so immensely unpopular. I mean, outside Biden was just such a, you know, a, a warm blanket of a figure that and like kind of unoffensive in so many ways for a lot of people that when everyone was in this really scary time, they reverted back to him. But like Pelosi, yeah. the, the national figures in, in terms of the Democratic Party are unable to make their case because people find them so repugnant. Well, I mean, it's also I mean, look, there, there's 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 too many factors for you to 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 say that those numbers, John, represent the work of never Trumpers and that they're they're It's their constituency. But well, uh, I mean, they they also won Republicans. Like if you go state by state, they won in every they won more Republican. They flipped more people who actually still self-identify as Republican. I mean, plus six in Arizona, yeah. plus three in Wisconsin, plus three in Michigan, even states where Trump won. They flipped more voters That's what to, I'm saying. to Biden than Trump vote. Flipped They're to- still Republicans. They're not anti-Republican. They're just never Trumpers. You know, some of them, yes, became Democrats to vote for whatever they gave up on the party. But the majority of them are still Republicans. They're they just voted for Biden. And this is not a new concept. This is, you know, how many people do we all know that have voted, you know, voted for Clinton, but voted for Reagan, voted for, uh, you know, Kerry, but or voted for Bush. But it, this is very normal in presidential I, I, elections. Yes. And all right. So I will I will concede. I, I will keep the door open. Let's put it that way. OK, I mean, you, you know. Uh, in the absence of uh, the Lincoln Project, would Joe Biden be considered a nicer guy uh, and someone that somebody wants to vote for over Donald Trump, even if they're a Republican? I don't know. Maybe. And they've also done studies on the effectiveness of Lincoln Project ads on independents and people who are not um, politically affiliated and positive Biden health care ads. And there was another there was another one. It was health care. And uh, it was it was another um, policy flank uh, or, or pillar, I should say. Those had the highest effect. And um, the only the, the demographics that responded to those negative and never Trump ads were hardcore Democrats. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I know what you will. I have family members who leaned Republican and like it is an anti-Trump vote, but they would have no idea who the Lincoln Project is. And, and, and to be fair to John, to be fair to John, um, the, the, it, you know, part of the reason why they may have disliked Trump was because there were never Trumpers out there, but that's not the same as a constituency, but maybe, maybe, maybe John, maybe, maybe. All right. He just came a little bit too hard. Uh, to be well, I'm not trying to promote them. That's what I opened with. Is I'm not, I'm just trying to say that. that no, like, I know you want to be you want to be says, fair in your analysis, and I'm just telling you right. that I think that like, you, you, there's there. I wish it wasn't that well, way. I mean, I wish it was all. Ca- you know, yeah. if you're going to say constituency, you need to show me a little more causation as opposed to correlation. But I appreciate the call, John, that you <laughs> made today at almost 1:48. All right, thank you for the call. John from San Antonio uh, destroys yeah. Sam Cedar. Yeah, that <laughs> happens. That's happened before. It's not it's nothing new. Nothing new. All right, we got time for one more call right now. Calling from a 612 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh Bullprog from Minneapolis. Bullprog from Minneapolis. Uh how are you? What's on your mind? Good. Oh boy, you say keep it quick, huh? Uh <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, going on as far as uh, Minneapolis is preparing for the uh, Derek Chauvin trial. Um, And uh, so downtown, there's a lot of uh, barriers and fencing and razor wire that's going up. They're spending a lot of money to uh, prepare for a a fair trial, quote unquote. Uh, We'll see how that pans out. I don't think uh, activists are too hopeful for a uh, good for a conviction. Uh, so we're still focused on the 24 demands. Uh, last week, we had a story come out that the city was going to pay uh, six social media yes. influencers to put out state approved messages. And hold on, let's put that uh, story on the screen. We have it from CNN. I'll pop this up. This is, I mean, 
I don't feel like a city should be doing this. <laughs> I've heard of stuff. Uh, I mean, I don't even know how to like, even almost like, I mean, look, I guess I shouldn't be terribly, um, here it is, a mini city, uh, Minneapolis City Council approved the plan for authorizing 18, 1.8, 1.1 million dollars in funding, almost 1.2, with contracts of various community organizations throughout the trial, plan including the influencers, hiring the influencers defined as having a large social media presence would have required them to share city generated and approved messages. I mean, what? I, manufacturing I, consent right there. Oh my gosh. It's not even manufacturing. It's just like buying it essentially. Yeah, buying the marketplace it. of consent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I like the idea of like you're funding uh, community organizations, I guess. And the idea is that like, hey, just keep everybody, you know, for propaganda and, and, purposes. And, well, they buy, they buy ads. I mean, this isn't a new thing. It's just a new way of facilitating yeah. advertising. Like a lot of, you know, hurt communities like Detroit, like had a big ad push at one point. Buffalo did. I mean, you know. ads are a little bit more transparent, right? Yeah. I mean, because yeah. the ads up there paid for by the city. Uh, the, the, the social media influencers are a little bit creepy. Well, yeah. I mean, but the, 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 when you're on Instagram, they're already doing all this kind of stuff too, yeah. right? Where oh, without a doubt, I just don't want yeah. the city uh, using taxpayer dollars in that way. I mean, you got to be more transparent about it. I know, but maybe if Andrew Yang becomes a uh, mayor, we're going to have TikTok houses. I was on his website, yeah. and then all these uh, New York <laughs> TikTokers are gonna are gonna be putting out pro NYP. Yeah, <laughs> they'll be like, we're taking the train to the Bronx to go to our TikTok house. Yeah, There's yeah. And and the cops will be there and they will be respectful. They'll be respectful, yeah. That's what the influencers are going to say. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, Sam, you mentioned um, how you'd like to see this stuff go to like neighborhood organizations. Um, and last week we had another press conference from the mayor saying that he had uh, like 10.6 million that he was going to put towards uh racial justice and healing um but if you look at the numbers on that it breaks down to 5.5 .5 million dollars going to commercial property redevelopment uh 4.75 million uh to reconstruct the intersection uh in conjunction with planned uh rapid transit improvements and then a, a 300,000 for reconciliation and economic inclusion, transformation, transformational racial healing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so yeah, just a drop in the bucket compared to what we're asking for. We, uh, with our demands um, and the addendum, we, we included investments in neighborhood organizations, which would total 155 million over 10 years. And the city said, we can't do that. We're hemorrhaging money because of COVID. And last week, we also got the news that Minnesota has a surplus of $1.6 oh, wow. billion. Dollars. Wow. So, oh. yeah, we're, we're fighting hard here. Full Prague, can you, do you is there a, um, a website that you can point us to to see the, the list of demands and just people get more information on organizing, et cetera? Yeah, uh, you can go to bit.ly slash George Floyd square hyphen A, and that'll be the, that's the Justice Resolution 001 with the say, addendum say, of the uh, outline. Say budget. it one more time, bit.ly, that's a bit.ly link, bit.ly yeah, back, backslash George Floyd square hyphen A. George Floyd square hyphen A, okay. All right. Uh, thanks for the call, Bullprog. Thank you. Love you guys. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, folks, we will put that in the uh, po the podcast description and the YouTube description uh, for your folks in the area or just to get more information on what, uh, what the demands are. Um, Emma, take the, uh, the lead for a second. I'll be right back. Sure. What's up? <laughs> Sam's got to go real quick. <laughs> He's got a I thing. He's got a meeting. He'll be right back. I, I can't. I I can't get that 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 clip of of Trump out of my head to say to Martha McSally. Got to be quick. It's like becoming a tick. And that's yeah. That's said it like forty five times on the show today. Um. So let's do a clip, shall we, Nomi? We shall. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, 
the Biden administration is taking a lot of heat, and I think rightly so, for their backing off of holding holding the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, accountable for his orchestrating of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And uh, Jen Psaki is on her heels trying to defend this uh, position that's clearly meant to, to appease the leaders of Saudi Arabia and maintain that relationship based on arms sales and, of course, that sweet, sweet oil. Here's Jen Psaki uh, yesterday, I believe. Back on Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. during the campaign, obviously, former Vice President Joe Biden was very well aware of the history of the U.S. government in terms of who they sanction and who they haven't. But yet he said, we're going to make them pay the price and make them the pariah that they are. How does this come anywhere close to his pledge to Americans in November of 2019 at that debate? Well, first, the president has been clear to his team, and he's been clear publicly, that the relationship is not going to look like what it's looked like in the past. And even before the release of the report on Friday, We had taken actions as an administration to make that clear through diplomatic conversations to our partners and allies in the region and through our actions. And that includes uh, a a change in how we are communicating with the Saudis, counterpart to counterpart, going back to uh, that appropriate line of communication. It includes not holding back and raising concerns about human rights abuses. We did see last month that Saudi Arabia did release two uh, dual national prisoners and women's rights activists. It includes uh, pulling back from our support from the war in Yemen. But it's important to also note that there are areas where we have an important relationship with Saudi Arabia, intelligence sharing, uh, also helping defend against the threats and the rocket attacks that they are getting, um, uh, you know, getting from uh, bad actors uh, right at their doorstep. And, you know, global diplomacy requires um, holding uh, countries accountable when needed, but also acting in the national interest of the United States. And that's exactly what the president's trying to do. Notice she said holding countries accountable there, right? Notice she also said pulling back in our support for the war on Yemen. So when she mentions that the United States is still going to be providing support for rocket attacks along the Saudi border, what that means is we are still sort of supporting the war in Yemen. supporting the war in Yemen. And notice also how, I may may have said this out loud already, but I want to reiterate the point, holding countries accountable. So not holding an individual accountable, not sanctioning MBS for the fact that he hired a gang of his buddies, basically, to murder and dismember a United States resident, a columnist for The Washington Post, not holding him accountable at all. And then this, like, liberals, be real here. If Trump had done this, you know that every network would be criticizing him to the nines every single day. And they should. And we should be doing the same for Joe Biden, especially because he said his stance on foreign policy in Saudi Arabia would be markedly different, and it's just not. And that he'd hold them accountable. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, not just this. I mean, journalists should be speaking out. I mean, this is such an egregious example of our – I mean, that that's what I'm finding with all these decisions in the last, like, month is Biden – is revealing himself without the cover of a Republican Senate, which, you know, I'm still not convinced he wanted to win in uh, in Georgia, uh, without the cover of a Republican Senate, he's revealing himself in every single way. And also the mo- as in a moment of crisis, people are just more conscious of these, like these decisions that used to happen behind closed doors were too complicated for folks to really wrap their heads around. But this was such an egregious, egregious situation, a disgusting example of how we are completely beholden to certain foreign interests and then match that with like say the New Yorktana nomination. I think that kind of, I mean, this is, this is just a blatant example of how uh, the Biden administration is, is, is not understanding like all eyes are open now. It's not just the progressives, it's, it's Democrats, it's the world, it's journalists. I don't know. I'm, yeah, I mean, well, I don't know what well, to say at this point. Like, Well, luckily, look, I mean, you mentioned journalists speaking out. Of course, they should do that more. And, you know, our frustration with the media uh, knows Well, no it was bounds. against one of their own. I mean, it was a Washington Post reporter. Like, well, the Washington Post uh, yeah. did write an op-ed about this, right? I believe yeah. their opinion. Oh, here we go. Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> um, what happened? 
they, I believe that they did speak out against us. So, like that's one of their own, right? But all media organizations should be speaking out against us. And, and let's be real, we have seen a more conciliatory attitude by the media towards Joe Biden um, because he's brought things back to status quo. And um, yeah. the, the best he's doing is hold the line. And although, the line, yes, they're the point, though. like the lines change. You can't go back to Obama post Trump. You can't. It's, you can't. It's you might have been able to get away with that. You did get away with that before Trump. But now it's like the trenches it, it, were gushing with blood. Everybody sees what's going on. And I mean, listen, like Jeff Bezos should speak out. It's his paper. Yeah. And and look, and and, and I said, hold, look, the one point nine tr- trillion dollar stimulus is a very good bill. Let's be real. And they did learn a lesson in that area. But in terms of foreign policy, Tony Blinken and Joe Biden and an entire foreign policy oper- apparatus has done nothing of substance, including their stance on the embassy remaining in Jerusalem and Israel, including what we're seeing in Saudi Arabia. And as I mentioned, these like semantics points about defending Saudi Arabia's borders and then ostensibly ending support for the war in Yemen are very key. We pointed this out when they initially made the announcement, how precise this language was. And you're seeing why that precision was so important because and, and we are still supporting that genocide in in some ways. And the strikes, um, you know, not consulting with Congress fully, you know, basically issuing a memo. It's And then another, just another statistic I heard this morning that blows my mind. I think 50% of Yemenis are uh, experiencing hunger right now. 50% of Yemenis are experiencing hunger right now. And this is in large part due to what we have done to, and the support that we provided th- throughout the region. Support for Saudi Arabia as a nation state right now in any fashion is supporting genocide. So why we, we may have pushed back and pulled back some of our arms and some of our arm sales that are specifically going for those purposes, even uh, a, a support for Saudi Arabia in terms of defense is still buttressing this effort in other ways. And so let's be real. Uh, the, the, the changes from how Donald Trump treated Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, and how Joe Biden is currently treating them and, and Tony Blinken in that administration, it's, it's been negligible. It's not been enough at this point. And, um, that the, the backlash that they're receiving about this uh, MBS decision or lack of decision is, is indicative yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you're right in terms of like the, the, the awareness of the left of a lot of these mechanisms and just sort of more broadly speaking, just the, the level of political awareness that's out there is much higher, I think, than the Biden administration sort of really fully after, yeah. you know, comprehended, comprehended. And I, and I think function, part of it is a function of just the progression of technology yeah. and social media that has taken place over the past four years, four and a half years, you know, like, I mean, in the last years of the Obama administration, there was not, you know, there wasn't the same level of engagement. And then a bunch of it was just like, people became much more engaged during the Trump years. Um, and, and, and part of it is possible also like COVID, like, I, it wouldn't s- surprise me if in the white house, somebody said like, you know, when this pandemic's over, there's going to be a lot less scrutiny. <laughs> right? Maybe, I mean, but it's also an economic disaster. I mean, there's there's all these things happening I, at once. You have a, a more I'm engaged, not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just yeah, saying that 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 notion would would I would be surprised if somebody hadn't contemplated that in the White House. I mean, the, even just the questions that Jen Psaki, yes, they're they're giving the uh, Reporters are giving them more of a pass, but they are also asking direct questions like that NBC reporter. I, I, I do think it's it's a little different. Like, you know, it's it's obviously more uh, the temperature has calmed down quite a bit in that that briefing room, but they're asking the questions. They see what the conversations are online. I mean, that was a very like online question that yeah. he asked. Yes. Yeah. And to equate and- those two things, that question would have never come in any other era. You would have just never heard that type of, of di- you know, they wouldn't have thought to make that question. You're right, because they did get that from sort of what was in the air in social media. 
I also just want to make this point because I got messaged on Twitter by uh, a fan about this because when we were talking about, you know, the next frontier of how Joe Biden's going to be critiqued, maybe that was yesterday, um, about China. And I said, I, I don't care. I don't care about Joe Biden being tough on China, meaning like, not that I don't care how that affects Chinese people and escalates things. That's how it was taken. Mm. I meant that, like, as liberals, that's not an issue that resonates with us where like, oh, he needs to be tougher, right? What I was saying is that the Republicans are going to use that as their attack because that seems to resonate with them based on the polling. They want tough on China policies. That wraps up xenophobia in it. It also wraps up, um, it allows them to touch on the same points Trump talked about with jobs going elsewhere without really having any policy changes that would uh, prevent outsourcing of jobs. So I just wanted to clarify that. Point. It also hits the business community. I mean, I'm I, Fox Business, you know, talks about China all day long. They don't, you know, care about jobs being outsourced. They, they care, care about competition. So it's a I mean, that's a Bannon strategy. Uh, let's go to the phone call from a 954 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello. This is Thomas from Richmond. Can you hear me? Thomas from Richmond. What's on your mind? Uh, I wanted to pick y'all's brain about the legalization debacle we had here in Virginia. Wait, what was the debacle? I thought it was legalized. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, we uh, criminalized it last year um, in July. But they passed the bill on compromise on Monday. Right. 2024 is the effective legalization date. Um, It's kind of a poison pill. It recriminalizes some criminal justice reforms that had been done over the summer. Um, Oh, I did not. I did not realize that. Yeah. So um, the black community here has been pretty upset about it. Um, A lot of my coworkers are feeling pretty betrayed. Um, The General Assembly had um, banned police officers from using, uh, you know, your car smells like marijuana thing um, like six months ago. Yeah. And this this, uh, legalization bill essentially reinserts that to give the police um, jurisdiction to pull people over for uh, the smell of marijuana, which even under the present decriminalization regime uh, with a civil penalty that we have right now is still being enforced at a 70 to 30 rate. Um, you know, 70% of the people pulled over uh, and given civil penalties under the current regime are black, even though, you know, the population's like 80% white, 20% black in the state. Um, so there's a couple other things. I mean, it's important to note that eight of our progressive um, Democrat um, members of the General Assembly uh, refused to take a vote at all on the legalization bill. Um, one of the Democratic candidates, candidates for gov- Governor Jennifer uh, McClellan um, basically said this is not a legalization bill and sort of totally washed her hands of it. Mm-hmm. And then um, another uh, Democrat from Newport News um, said this is a total betrayal and a selling out of the justice movement uh, to the business class. Um, the bill also doesn't deal with any of the provisions for the social justice impact of the licensing of businesses um, for the next year. It has to be reapproved um, next year by the General Assembly. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a total mess, um, even though a lot of Democrats are trying to take an end run and say they, they so there's also, I mean, there's also some rumors um, and these are rumors, I want to be clear, that Northam, our governor, and Terry McAuliffe, who's um, the Clinton hack who's running for governor again, um, did right. some backroom deals Amazing. to put a, uh, to convince a bunch of the conservative Democrats in our assembly to put these poison pills in the legislation, because essentially all the other candidates that are running for governor and lieutenant governor um, and attorney general are all members of the General Assembly, um, and quite a few of them are pro-worker and have pretty good 
platforms um, insofar as you can be a good Democrat in Virginia. So if I understand, and this is a rumor, you should say that the, the speculation is they made a deal that would force the progressives running against um, a McAuliffe, McAuliffe to take a vote for a bill that was sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't type of bill. Yeah, and they didn't, to be clear. Um, eight of the Democrats in the sort, I wouldn't call them all progressives. It's also just people who are in like the Congressional Black Caucus who tend to be pretty awesome. Like their, their, their legislative recommendations are all, almost, you know, he, line for line what people in our broader, broader social democratic movement would want. Um, so they, they're all, the, they, they, they just didn't vote for the bill. So it passed like 47 to 44 um with no republicans voting for it um so yeah i mean it's not it's not a completely uncontroversial bill and yeah i would i mean that's a rumor um that that, that that's what's going on um but it's um terry mcauliffe is a is a well-reputed shithead so yeah. um i think it's possible that that's what happened well i like i say it's just a rumor but it, it's interesting um no doubt. I had no idea. I, I you know, I, I didn't deep uh, dig too, too deep into it. I just saw that they had passed it yesterday. Appreciate the update on that. Yep. Just wanted to keep you all in the loop. Thank Have you. A good one. Thanks. That sucks. Yeah. Uh, that's bad. McAuliffe is just. Oh, my God. The worst. Um, can't find anybody else, man. I, know. I mean, to me, that's uh, a sign that they're weak, retreads. though. Like yes. they can't, they're, they're digging for the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, honestly. Like, Last time I saw he... Terry McAuliffe, he had a sippy cup full of alcohol in it. So, getting on the stage of a DGA event. And uh, he's like, I love the gays. That's literally what he told my friend. So oh my God. Well, that's uh, their uh, top I, I, tier. I'm not going to knock him for that. No, it was kind of fun, but like yeah. that's their top tier. So <laughs> um, Let's go back to uh, CPAC a little bit. We still got a little bit. Um, Trump supporters at CPAC still upset at Fox News. Fox News is, is it still hurting in the uh, the the ratings? It was having a tough go of it, um, bad. Wonder if they have recovered. They here might still is, be doing some uh, musical chairs over there. Here is a uh, seven o'clock hour. Yeah, a Trump supporter. <laughs> do you still watch? Oh my Fox God, News? I do not watch Fox News. Only Tucker Several Carlson Trump supporters. and Laura Ingram. Why is that? Because Fox News sold out. They sold out to the globalists. They sold out to the China-owned advertisers. And I definitely do not respect Fox News anymore. I like Fox Nation. They're doing okay. I don't no, I don't think they've been supportive of the what? truth. Yeah. I, I've stopped watching all news since the election. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Um, because it's depressing and makes me angry. Fox, CNN, MSNBC, no. they're all the same. They're all suppressing the truth for this country. I like uh, Jesse Waters. Jesse Waters. And yeah, I think he's great. And Sean Hannity's good. I like Sean Hannity good. Oh you know, he's been back in the president 100%. Depends on what show. What shows you like? Tucker, Hannity. But the, the like the, it's mainly the, um, the it was the election uh, night, like the, the people behind the scenes that were screwing things over. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Tucker. It wasn't Hannity. So I'm fine with still watching them. I'm not a huge uh, Fox fr uh, fan, you know, okay. but just some of the personalities. What Fox did on, on the election, so a lot of us feel that that was, uh, they betrayed us as well. So I know that you know, a lot of them just abandoned Fox completely. I would come back to Fox. Um, no, I probably wouldn't. Not full time. Oh my God. Really. No. The I like election? too much Tucker and um, I catch a few minutes of Hannity and uh, Laura Ingram for about a few minutes. And then uh, I've been choosing Newsmax and OAN for my source really? of information and the Epic Times. Tucker. <laughs> Carlson, he always and he drives the, the liberals mad. I, I want to I want to forgive him. I, I want them to right I want them to right the wrong and and stop trashing Trump and get behind the America first. I know there are some conservatives that want to burn FNC in effigy and think, oh God, they've all become a bunch of raving leftists. No, they haven't. Okay? You know, I'm secure enough in my beliefs that I can handle hearing someone who disagrees with me. If we're going to attack yeah. liberals, that's, that's me. constantly being triggered by everything, which they are, I don't want to see conservatives triggered either. It's a, oh. it's a beautiful hat. 
that is i mean first off um i think the the idea that they watch that stuff to trigger the libs uh and to own the libs is underrepresented there <laughs> i would say um but it's fascinating their perspective on what their news is supposed to do i mean you know there was like it was you know I don't, are they still doing like we report you decide that's not been a logo for a long time like the idea they are basically just we want cheerleaders period period it really is just and then they can no flate it and then they can flate it with you know that being real right well what's weird about this is cpac like i don't know if you guys have ever covered cpac before it's that it's got like a very it's it's a distinctly different vibe right now. Like this is not the CPAC goofier. from a few years ago. It's, it's goofy. It's Trumpian. It's yeah. Trump. It's yeah. Trump's party now. I mean, I don't know if the Never Trumpers just didn't go to CPAC or if the or if it's just transforming. I mean, I think you know Trump's like uh, won the straw poll, but he only won it for like sixty five percent or something. Interesting. And and I and I will tell you this. Like I remember CPAC. In 2006, I didn't go, but I remember, you know, just uh, following it through reporters. And I, I paid a lot more attention, I think, probably to it back in the day. But they there was a strong contingency of people who felt that George W. Bush was not significantly conservative. Yeah. Um, because of his spending and this and that, like, you know. Underneath, I think the supposed principles they had, they were always like this. It was always about owning the libs and triggering the libs and whatnot. There was a, a veneer, and sometimes that veneer was a little bit, a couple millimeters thicker than for other people. But ultimately, I mean, I think we've shown, not we, I mean, society, I mean, they have shown that their, um, their set of principles were really just, I mean, there was no principles. I mean, it was, it was really just own the libs and it was all sort of like culture. And I, and I will, you know, say like, I do remember, you know, you get into like 2009, maybe it was, and that was the next iteration. I mean, it was there, but it was more, they went from like waging a culture war, right? I mean, like, you know, uh, Buchanan was talking about this in 93. Right. Maybe they were always there, but their their understanding of the meta of it, like sort of culminated with Breitbart, who right. was like, you know, the politics were all downstream from culture. Right. And Breitbart, you know, whereas Buchanan would say we're involved in a culture war in, in 93, uh, but he was trying to convince people that their politics was, you know, sort of, um, you know, that there's also this culture war that is impacting the politics. But Breitbart was, had no policy. Like you but could this ask. Is, this is could, it. It's, it's like a conspiratorial aspect to it. I mean, it was exclusively yeah. culture. Like, I mean, I, I, I would have exchanges with Breitbart. He had no policy. He bragged mm -hmm. about having no policy difference. I mean, preference. He didn't care. For him, it was all cultural. I mean, there was not, the, there, it wasn't like the cultural implications of your policies. It was like policies are downstream from culture. It's just culture, period. And, um, and he was, admittedly didn't really stick to even the culture stuff. Like when you went to him one-on-one, -on -one, you called him out. He was like, yeah, it's a business. He was extremely transparent off off screen with what he was doing. Um, but I mean, now I think like the the how Breitbart you just utilize the media. I mean, it's not just culture now. It's conspiracy and culture. Like, Emma, you've been to Trump rallies. And if they see you with a camera, I mean, it's not just like they say, don't trust them. They're the media. They start to surround you like a mob. It's extremely uh, it, it's it's scary. It's a very scary feeling that I don't feel like one I a week, felt. baby. One a week for like one a week. Four mo four months. <laughs> that was a yeah. fun time. I Something mean, it's a like dangerous that. time. And and like remember when Michelle Fields got attacked and that made all the news. I mean, that was sort of the beginning of seeing how how what what this could lead to. But like, well, if Biden doesn't see that, that's what I'm concerned about. His his inability to understand on one hand, just how much people are paying attention, but on the other hand, how this 
conservative, you, you, you barely squeaked by and this is not going away. And what are you going to do about it? How do you make sure, how do, how do you fight the, the media wars? How do you take on the big tech companies that are facilitating this? I mean, I think this is much bigger than cult, just culture. It's, it's, it's a conspiracy ridden movement that's growing and it's not organic. Well, the biggest imp uh, impediment to Biden pursuing any agenda that would sort of like provide stuff on a separate track is is frankly the conservative Democrats, right? Yeah. Is a couple of Democrats and his own unwillingness to you know to take steps to you know in in any way impinge upon the traditions of the Senate. But <laughs> since we're talking about um, about the, the cultural battles, like and you know it's all going to be like. The next year, every time we turn on, every time you hear something from conservatives, it's going to be all about cancel culture. I mean, it, it is. Th this is just going to be relentless. I, we, Political we have, correctness 2.0. Exactly. Sick. And um, should we start with a gas station or should we get into the meat of it with Dr. Seuss? I think I like I think I, I want to go to the meat of it straight. Wow. With with Dr. Ladies Seuss. and gentlemen, we could, we could do there, it in a hat. We could do it with a cat. <laughs> The, I think the idea that everything is down culture from, you know, culture downstream. at this point. Is Cultural runoff. Dr. Brendan, did you, where did you go? I, I must have cut out. No, I was just saying that I th saying that cult, everything is downstream from culture is where we start with Dr. Seuss. So we end up with actual policy. Right. Um, apparently the estate or the company that was set up to protect the copyright or the estate or the name of uh, Dr. Seuss has stopped uh, publication of six books. I don't know how many Dr. Seuss books there are, but I would imagine there are dozens. I mean, uh, because I didn't even recognize these six books and I have read a lot of Dr. Seuss. I mean, not personally, but I mean, my kids. Um, <laughs> six of them were, were struck because they were racist in their um, and they're sort of like their co construction. I haven't seen the, the books, but I mean, these are, this is the determination that the company, I'm not aware, maybe there was uh, people who were pushing back on this, but you know, it's not like it was a massive. Well, he was a movement. known racist. I mean, that was the yeah. issue too. He was and, not like aligned with the Nazis too, or am I making, making that up? I'm getting confused. It was at least sympathetic and the cartoons were explicitly anti-black, et cetera. <laughs> so they've taken uh, six of them offline because uh, they recognize it was from, you know, the, there was an ideology that was being uh, projected through these. And this is really upsetting to the folks at Fox and Friends. What next? Take off one more out of production? It is March 2nd. It is Read Across America Day. It is also Dr. Seuss's birthday. And traditionally in our country, we celebrate Read Across America on his birthday because we all grew up reading his books and loved them. But uh, Biden is, there is a proclamation claiming that this is Read Across America Day, but he is leaving out the mention of Dr. Seuss because of this one county, Loudoun County in Virginia. And they are saying that it's controversial and they want to cancel Dr. Seuss. Yeah, they, uh, the researchers surveyed 50 Dr. Seuss books and concluded that out of the 2,240 identified human characters, there are 45 characters of color representing 2% of the total human population. Of the 45 characters, 43 exhibited behaviors and appearances that align with harmful and stereotypical orient oriental tropes. There were, uh, the remaining two human characters are identified in the text as African and both align with the theme of anti-blackness. How they've gotten this in this one study from this one group and this conclusion is, <laughs> is beyond me. But the cancel culture is canceling Dr. Seuss, at least for now. And judging by the way things are going, it's only going to grow from here. A little different from what President Trump uh, called it, Dr. Seuss and what he did. Remember, he said this. It was just last year on Read Across America Day. On this Read Across America Day, we recall <laughs> the motivational words of Dr. Seuss, an American icon of literature. Uh, remember Barack Obama in 2016, March 2nd, birthday of one of America's revered wordsmiths, Dr. Theodore Geisel uh, or Dr. Seuss. What's changed? 
Uh, times have changed, and suddenly, you know, uh, and Ainsley, to your point, after the Loudoun County uh, School District said, no, we've looked at this study that simply looked at the numbers, uh, we're going to essentially cancel it from this particular program. Uh, I, I, I don't, you know, going forward, we've got a basement full of those books. What are people going to do with Dr. Seuss? Leave them. They would like to see, well, or, you know, just stop, stop reading them all together. They're pretty good books, um, you know, uh, but you know, people have tr problems with how the various characters books. are it's identified amazing. in the book. And I guess going forward, every book will re be reviewed in such a manner. And I'm a Democrat. They're, they're, they're so desperate to try and figure out what the problem is here. Like they're trying to like, like they're yeah. trying to set up like what the slippery slope is. And they can't even come up with what the slippery slope is. Never mind where the slope leads. They're just like, well, I mean, if you get rid of these books, then, uh, you know, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> in my basement. Yeah, like, well, I've got six books. They're like this big. What am I? Do I go to a nuclear uh, like uh, a dump facility? Like, do I need to go to uh, you know? Do I need to call people in hazmat? Suit? Like, how are we going to get rid of this? Like, it's too complicated. Like, they can't come up. But with... they're they're too self serious too to like even miss all of the rhyming opportunities that they had. <laughs> I mean, that's all I keep thinking about. Like, do do like uh, do I like cancel culture? Uh, I do not like it, Sam. I am or whatever. You know, B Biden's kids like Dr. Seuss on the uh, on a boat. He's doing it <laughs> with a goat. Like, they, I don't know. They could have gone so... that far, but they got to take it seriously. So where do you go? Well, here's where you go with it. If they're gonna get rid of, if if, we... if Dr. Se Go I ahead. think we should correct the record quick on Dr. Seuss, not pro-Nazi, actually uh, anti-Nazi. I can't oh. speak for the rest of his politics. So, Sorry, yeah, I but knew he, there was something about the Nazi. That yeah, remember. he did like anti-Hitler propaganda, actually. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Just, uh, just anti-Black. And, and so. And, and anti-Asian. He, and so where are they going to go with this? And like, you know, they've, they've explored the problem of like, what do you do with these books? Like, where will we put them? Like, will they melt through our trash can or what? what's going to happen? Well, they've figured it out. You know what happens when you stop publishing three or four books that the publisher decides to stop publishing? This, number 11. Oh, going forward, that's, that's that's what control, like. what a what a uh, what a radical organization decides to put together and eliminate children's books from a brilliant author that has helped spread the word of reading and the love of reading around the globe. And we're going to let one me to read uh, on group a daily decide basis. that it's not worthy of our eyes and our kids. That's a travesty. People you got to put the brakes on. Well, People are too scared. They uh, they don't want to be involved in all of this, so they'd rather just <laughs> cancel it all. And uh, listen, you gotta stand I, for something. Well, the do places it. we will go, the places yeah. we are going in this country right now. Think about what, what Disney Crazy. did with Disney Plus on those various uh, films that they've got on their platform. What they did was they simply put a disclaimer written by lawyers describing uh, this is from a certain period of time when feelings like this were that good? widespread. Well, it's explanatory, and then people can go ahead and watch the stuff and, you know, be a judge looking through that particular prism of now, Let's uh, make Dr. It clear. Seuss is being canceled. Yeah. Dr. Seuss should not be canceled in your home. Let this stay in that one county. And if you want that, if you don't want to read Dr. Seuss, go to that county. <laughs> so what do you think, <laughs> email us friends of if you do see it's yeah. just like I mean they could do this and they could acknowledge that black people exist and deserve it. Oh yeah, my god. Yeah, it's like it's like go go live in go live in X country if you think you know America's so bad. Go live in this county if you don't want to read Dr. Seuss. You know, I just gotta say now, one fish canceled, two <laughs> fish canceled. They may red not fish have canceled been aware. Blue fish canceled. All right, just let me finish that. Go on. <laughs> they may not have been aware, but apparently. Six of the books, and they keep talking about this one county, six of the books, basically, um, the uh, Dr. Seuss Enterprises said Leftists. that that they're going to stop publishing six of these books because of racist images in them. The free market, though. Listen, I mean, 
if you can't listen to the business leaders, they're making the decision. It's not coming from the public. Well, and let's be clear. Um, we're not, you know, we're still going to have children's books. And it's not like there are children out there going like, I really am my, I am not as well-rounded as I would be, or these are perspectives, these racist images. I am less than because I won't see these. Like, I mean, as if like somebody came out with a, um, you know, I don't know, uh, a book today with like Shylock images for, you know, Mr. Cohen, who's the baker, who just happens to be there and collecting everybody's money or something like that. Like, they'd be fine with that being published, right? Of course, because we've got to let everybody exposed to it. And it's in rhyme, so what's the harm? I mean, like, the idea that this is the end of the world for them is, um, it's, it's stunning. What do you expect them to read? You know, Sasha Malia's book, the, the Obama, that's, that's, or that's what they're scared. You could Time Kill Me's Histories. Of- one of the like oh, literally, you know, dozens yeah. of other Dr. Seuss books that are out there. You could read uh, no, if the entire full catalog of Dr. Seuss works isn't in print for in like 300 years from now, then we'll have failed Western civilization. Yeah, we and what will that, kill me uh... read? What will kill me read? I mean, that's his entire reading collection, right? He's still figuring out his ABCs. Yeah, yeah. kill me's a completionist, is the thing. In, in, yeah. in literature right. canon. If I can't read all the Dr. Seuss, then it's useless to read any of it. I'm just thinking about fully get it. All the books I've like wanted to read <laughs> and have been out of print for like decades and decades that no publisher will touch because I right. mean, what, what actually does uh, get stay in circulation is actually pro um, status quo. I'll just say that roughly. Of course. All right. Well, it's not just Fox and Friends. Um, they're, it's not like they can't find guests who will back up their concern about the Dr. Seuss gate. There's this cancel culture trying to cancel Dr. Seuss now. <laughs> oh, God. Where, how far are yeah. they going to take this? Uh, I, 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 there's no place that they won't go, uh, mm-hmm. Ainsley. There's no place they won't go. This he, week alone, a, they canceled Mr. Potato Head. Uh, you know, this <laughs> week know. alone, they canceled the Muppets. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're canceling Dr. Seuss from right. reading programs. I mean, these are books. I literally know the cat in the hat by heart without the book. Because I read it so many <laughs> wow, times to my children. My these guy. things are not racist. <laughs> you have Oreo Cookie chiming in on trans rights. I mean, what is going on? I have no it's idea. Absolutely insane. We'll just keep We've lost our minds oh and we're God, encouraging it, you know, by allowing it. You <laughs> saw, you know, the woke gotcha. mob goes after CPAC because gotcha. the stage apparently had Nazi symbolism because these guys are so obsessed with trying to create any right. link to that. Which it and did. it looked like Hyatt was doing a Which good job, did. but in 24 <laughs> hours, they too caved right. to the woke mob. Don, thanks. Which it did. He just, he just acknowledged. Yes, no, I think was... he said didn't. Oh. Uh, did, are you sure? Maybe he said it didn't. I mean, um, obsessed with trying to create any right. link to that, which it and did. it looked like Hyatt was doing a good job, but in twenty, 20- uh, I don't know. I think it's he hard, said it didn't. hard to tell. But yeah. um, are we monitoring Ducey though? Like, there needs to be a moment where he just I, kind yeah. of breaks it. I think Ducey <laughs> like, is just like I, I feel like somebody should look back and just see like it's pension vests in yeah. like six months or something like that. Exactly. It's one of those yeah. deals. Tenure. Like, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm three months out from, uh, from, from retirement. I just don't want to go on the street anymore. I don't want to go on the street anymore. It's amazing. Yeah. You know what I was trying to wrap that up. This is super impressive. And I didn't know this and I think they probably should have deployed this. I didn't realize that Don Jr. Had memorized cat in a hat. I mean, that's pretty good stuff. Yeah. I mean, he, he just, he, he spends all night railing lines, reading children's (laughs) books memorizing them well. for uh to impress his dad i remember this one dad <laughs> it's like it's like a way for him to get back to you know his childhood relive those memories with his dad Except i like how fox is with... bringing don jr on to, yeah. to sort of try and shore up their bona fides let's just play this one more um <laughs> god the cancel culture it's like it's like literally it's the only thing they're talking about on fox news <laughs> um here is uh steve Ducey. Um, on Fox and Friends yesterday, uh, today, talking about more cancel culture. It's clip number 13. In Petaluma, California, they decided, you know what? We got this new Safeway store. We're going to put uh, gas pumps in front of it. 
And so they had a meeting on it, and ultimately they decided, you know what, we've got enough gas stations in this town. We don't want people to run cars that run on fossil fuels. We want cars that run on electricity. Of course, they don't mention the fact that a lot of the electricity is created by fossil fuels, but that's a small point. Anyway, they have outlawed or, new or another construction problem. of brand new uh, pumps in Petaluma, California, and all new gas stations. Uh, existing stations cannot add pumps, but they can add electric charges. It's all part of the grassroots movement to try to get as many people to drive electric cars as possible. God the problem forbid. right now is the infrastructure for electric cars and the batteries. When you look at the range, how far can an electric car go, you can't really drive it across the country because you might get out to somewhere in Kansas where I'm from and it's suddenly like I'm out of electricity. Where do I plug this thing in? Are you yeah. kidding? They don't have the infrastructure. <laughs> exactly. So if you're thinking about uh, starting a new gas station in Petaluma, California, don't. Oh, to move darn it. Towns over. Well, it's just like we were Damn talking about it. cancel culture. It's coming for you. It's coming for you eventually. If you haven't felt it yet, it, you oh will. Oh, my God. Uh, things are just progressively getting uh, more and more extreme in our country. And this is what they want for the rest of the country as well. They want this not just for California. These grassroots uh, folks, they want it for everyone. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, definitely. She got her cancel culture quote very in. Dis They're canceling gas now. What's going on? They're putting you a live cap. In like, like... <laughs> There has not been uh, like zoning uh, restrictions in places in America ever before. Now it's cancel culture. Yeah. They're not allowing more gas stations in this town. So Un -American. if you were planning America <laughs> yeah. to build a gas station in Petaluma, California, sorry. Or you if you're planning. Pulled out from underneath you. Or if you're planning, like Steve Ducey was trying to claim he was for road tripping from where he <laughs> lives in New York to his home in Kansas. <laughs> ah, you won't be able to do that. I would love to know the last time Steve Ducey took a car trip to his hometown in Kansas as opposed to just getting on a little plane. My no, it's, it's, it's even more specific. It's if you're planning to go to Kansas from Panaluma or whatever the, oh, name of the town is. Yes, uh, it's something Ducey does so frequently. So frequently. Yeah, but again, I, so, you know, I got fixated last week on uh, how many times Megan McCain said I in that two minute clip we showed. I should torture myself and watch a whole Fox and Friends episode and see how many times I say cancel culture. There's like got to be a like a, a, a quota from the from the top of the, the food chain. They have to say it like at I least mean, 40 times. Coming for you. But Emma, I, they're coming I, for you. I just, I just want, I just, I just want everybody to sort of just absorb what we're talking about. A national news program talking about a zoning restriction, not allowing the licensing of new gas stations in a town of Petaluma, California, and then wedging it into a cancel culture story. Like, do you, you really can't go across the country and find something that's even like vaguely even more associated with cancel culture as opposed to like a zoning thing? Like, right. hey, guys, did you realize they've canceled? You, you can't get another liquor license in this locality here. Cancel culture. Yeah. They just can't cancel. You can't cancel a culture. Quota. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. They won't let this um, CVS in at this block. Because it's not zoned. Cancel culture. No, yeah. no pharmacies. And and okay, so how are people gonna get their uh prescriptions? You know, they cancel they can cancel a CVS in uh you know in uh Poughkeepsie, but uh, you know, what's next? You don't get any you don't get any prescriptions. Like I mean, like how do they they're man. doing that also, thing when it's running on oil. I mean, that's the ultimate thing is it's just like, okay, how do we package everything together on a slow news day and hit all of the points we need to? By the way, electric vehicles are not that energy efficient. So, you know, don't buy them because they're still I'm running on oil. I'm not even giving the, them that it's a slow news day. I mean, it's like that. There's there would be plenty of stuff yeah. going on for them to feel um, aggrieved by, but th that they choose not to. All right. I got to jump. Uh, let's uh, sorry. We don't have time for more calls and let's take some IMs and we get out of here. Um, Shen Batiro, Fruity is uh, uh, the Tom Brady's Magic Spoon flavors. Lee, New York City, I worked for a nurse union during Clinton plan and remember it was an extremely complicated plan that was tough to explain in one sentence, seemed doomed. Steve Mnuchin, let's say Biden decides to run in 2024, would the average Democratic voter object to his age alone? I'll tell you in 2023. Um, 
Kamal sneezes here in Wisconsin. Very few people shy away from the word socialism. Do you think it still has a negative impact nationally? I think it's certain age cohorts, but but less and less. Uh, Lancelot's regret when this cone guy says people are all scared of change. It's pure projection. I hear this a lot from comfortable liberals who can't understand why people would want change the status quo. There is always a cost to saying that you want to work with Republicans. It makes you look weak and contributes to the feeling among the masses that these people are lizards. This guy Cohen is pretty far removed from reality. I, I, I think you're misinterpreting what he is saying. He is reporting on what was the feeling at that time uh, in, in the making of this legislation. I don't know that he subscribes uh, to that as much as um, that was his interpretation of what was going on at the time. But uh, militant apathy, uh, not luck. Core Democratic voters showed up in Georgia. Walt Disney was the Nazi. California, uh, Bernie Legal, him, our crew. I've been an everyday listener nine years, but I had an extremely rare moment of disappointment last week when I am or inquired about the fate of the Summer Olympics in Tokyo. And both Sam and Emma expressed uh, that they hope the games will return this year. Sam, you should be especially well uh, aware of the utter devastation the modern Olympics has inflicted on the residents of host cities for many decades. The IOC is arguably the most corrupt and predatory sporting institution in the world, holds an untold body count driven by capital and state cooperation. Um, Okay, this is a long uh, thing. I mean, I, I've interviewed uh, Zyron in the past about um, uh, other places. I mean, I, I guess to a certain extent, um, it was a uh, offhanded response. I mean, I, I would want to know more about what's going on in Tokyo, but you're right. I mean, if it's anything like what we saw in, in Rio or in um, uh, Sochi, um, uh, you, you're right. You're right understandable uh we'll look into that um the tim caucus uh minneapolis to drop the plan to play influ pay influencers sam Massachusetts. sam 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 why the hell uh, haven't you had fran Leib leibowitz on this year you're right and the final i am of the day sterno uh, this country isn't conservative. The House is gerrymandered. The president is elected by an electoral college that's uh, biased to rural states. The Senate is biased to rural states. No, mate, you'll have to address that next week and uh, defend your comments. No, mate, Emma, Matt, Brendan, good job. Check See out No Me Show. Check out yes. No Me Show. Oh, we yes. have 15 minutes, guys. Go yes. jump in there. Go jump in into that tomorrow. chat. Big show. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Thanks, to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. But see the truth is